If you've seen the other parts, you get bragging rights in the comments. But if you haven't, go watch them right now. If that specialized intro is anything to go by, it means that we have officially reached peak death battle. Not to say that season 5 is the peak of the show, I actually think at least two more seasons are better than this, but rather it's the turning point from death battle where every season from here on out is better than the previous four. The fifth season is already a pretty cool milestone to have. You're halfway to 10, which means that we're halfway done with this ranking retrospective. Awesome! Not to mention we got that episode 100 to look forward to, and with all of this in mind, Death Battle wanted to take this season more seriously than the previous ones. And on top of that, this was the first of two seasons to have a theme to it. Season 5's theme consisted of matchups that were among the top 10% most requested. With two exceptions, but those have asterisks on them. Another thing is that this was the season where multiple animators helped out with episodes instead of just one, or at least they were credited this time. Again, there is one exception exception that has its own asterisk. But either way, these were what made this season a fan favorite. Maybe it's overshadowed by seasons 8 and 9, but generally more renowned than the likes of season 7 for example. Finally striking that balance between the frequent high points of season 2, the manpower of season 3, and the consistency of season 4. They've even received some extra manpower from Rooster Teeth, letting Death Battle use their sound engineers, Chris Kokinos and Philip Spann. And given how big the matchups would be, they'd have to increase the quality quality of the episodes as much as possible. But with that said, what the f*** happened with the season premiere? Okay, I kind of get why this matchup exists. You want to commemorate the upcoming Black Panther movie, which ended up becoming one of the most important films in the superhero genre. And yes, this was the most popular matchup for both. Or at least for Black Panther. But looking back on it now, yeah, this is definitely one of those times where a matchup was popular for a time, but then people started digging deeper into it, and eh, it's not so good anymore. But anyways, I thought that Black Panther's analysis was alright. Music felt way too intense for what's supposed to be a basic rundown of abilities, but I don't have anything against the royalty-free music they use. The quick tangent, I do miss the original Invader theme that was used at the beginning of every episode. Don't get me wrong, I like the new one that's used, and I also appreciate how it acts as a sort of nod to that theme, but I mean, come on, the Invader theme is just too iconic for the series. But sorry, I'm going on a bit of a tangent, I wonder why I keep doing that. But aside from that, I guess I have no complaints here. But going into Batman's analysis, I was surprised that they were able to find a ways to nuance the gosh damn Batman. Mentioning his motivations for fighting crime and the fact that he's aware of his mental instability, albeit briefly. Also keep in mind that they literally gave him two slides to talk about the gadgets he has. Get it memorized, alright? But aside from that, I didn't gain too much from these analyses. I mean, one of them is entering his third episode, so what else was I supposed to get? But the fight? Hmm. There's quite a bit of problems. Batman uses batterings, exploding batterings, tranquilizers on the lions, bombs, and the bolus. So much for having two slides, am I right? Yeah, it's not too much different from his last episode, but Black Panther's got it even worse. Not only do they talk about his gadgets in the analysis as well, but in the fight, he uses literally none of them. Not even the sonic blast that everyone was expecting him to use. This doesn't just block incoming attacks, it can literally rob them of their momentum. They stop dead and fall straight down. Okay. Sorry for wanting a half decent fight dynamic, I guess. So with all of this in mind, I am not gonna sugarcoat it. I did not hate this fight that much. I mean, yeah, there's a little bit of jank, but in spite of how slow it is, some combos look really cool and all the other attacks look fine enough. And I actually like the fight in the zoo. 
Seeing them find ways to deal with the lions and T'Challa yeeting a rhino and killing it looks needlessly flashy, but I love it. <laughs> and then Batman uses that time to retreat to the sewers and set up a bomb trap, and then T'Challa leaps across the debris within the blink of an eye was really cool. Darkening the background to emphasize how short of a time span he's leaping. Hell, in Batman's previous episodes, he didn't use strategy and time management quite like this. The most he did was hide in a smoke cloud or darkness or whatever, but his opponent was able to immediately counter it. Whereas Batman actually catches T'Challa off guard. So I guess that's one point it has over Batman versus Captain America, where he mainly just uses stealth and then, oh, I'm gonna punch this guy and hope it works. And likewise, I like the death. It's a nice combo, and the Orca finishing Batman off was pretty cool. And for another compliment, as simple as it might be, Battle at the Zoo is kinda nice. But the name sucks and the track art is so bland, but then again, this is where they started doing original tracks and having track art for it. But then there's the conclusion, and everything sucks here. Yeah, it's correct by its own logic, but they unironically tried to make the argument that Batman would never create a gun because of his refusal to use firearms. I mean, that's not wrong. But then you realize that this entire tangent in the conclusion is the one reason why they bring up his refusal to use firearms in his analysis. Okay, I'm a sucker for callbacks like this, and Death Battle has done plenty of them in the past, but this one is stupid. I'm sorry. But again, it is correct by its own logic, which is more than I can say for Batman vs. Captain America. In fact, this episode is better than that one by more than you would think. 43 out of 100. I don't really have that much to add, so let me show one of the deleted scenes in its entirety. Precisely. Actually, now that I'm looking at it now, why does T'Challa take off his mask at the beginning of the fight? That seems like something he would do at the end of it. But, oh well. Okay, so in a roundabout way, there are three asterisks, and one of them is going to this episode. Raven had other opponents in that of Scarlet Witch and Phoenix, and they were more popularly requested than Twilight Sparkle, but all of Raven's matchups were in the top 10% by virtue of Raven being a popular request. So, uh, fair enough. And they went with Twilight Sparkle for some variety, and they also thought the connections were the best. I think I could see that. Maybe Raven vs. Phoenix is better. I don't know. I couldn't tell ya. But I do think it's better than Raven vs. Scarlet Witch, so I'm glad we got that one instead. Another thing worth noting is that this was Nick Kramer's last episode as a writer. He would come back as a video editor for a good few years, but after this episode, he would be replaced by Sean Hinz as far as writing goes. And, hmm, this is probably not the best note to end off on, because from what I've seen, there are some diehard My Little Pony fans who hate this episode, similarly to how I hate Ragna vs. Soul. Mmm. <laughs> Man, why is that the second time I've made that comparison? At first, I didn't understand. I mean, yeah, they do the whole Ugg ponies thing, but they show some respect. And it's not as bad as Starscream vs. Rainbow Dash, right? I mean, the latter part is true, but after revisiting that one, as well as the other My Little Pony episode, I began to understand why, but we'll get into that later. Raven's analysis starts off with a pretty good joke about Boomstick stealing from Wiz, and there isn't a whole lot of Teen Titans content, but there are people who claim that Teen Titans ruined the common perception of Raven. I've actually seen some of the arguments for that, but I'm not here to say whether they're right or wrong, because I don't read DC Comics that much. I just like the animated universe, it's not that deep. But no matter where you stand on that, things go south with a cringy Kickstarter joke that goes on for way too long. Ugh, knock it off. And then there's the whole megawatt hours calc, which is... Actually, why do people complain about this? I get that Death Battle never uses this unit of energy anywhere else, but they are using it correctly. I mean, do you guys know what a megawatt hour is? Because megawatt hours is used to determine energy that light is giving off, and this also applies to laser beams as well. So, yes, they are using it correctly. I don't know why people are whining about this so much. Besides, at least it's directly convertible to units of energy. You can't say that about pounds per square inch, and yet nobody wants to whine about that for some reason. But aside from that, honestly, the rest of Raven's analysis kind of bothers me, but only retroactively. You'll see why. For Twilight Sparkle's analysis, once again, we have Boomstick going, EW PONIES! You know, Grenda Grendinator would never say this out loud, at least not unironically. <laughs> so, um, EW PONIES! 
Yeah, I think that's more like it. But seriously, it's almost as prevalent as in Rainbow Dash's analysis, and that is terrible. Especially since I don't think he ever made a joke like that in Pinkie Pie's analysis. And if he ever did, it was justified because Pinkie Pie was actually annoying him in some way, and he was more fixated on the fourth wall breaking she has. Aside from that, it's just a respect thread, and also wall level Twilight Sparkle. She should go up against Virgil to determine who is the strongest wall level character Death Battle has ever used. I mean, I guess I kind of liked Boomstick trying to actually weaponize friendship and then say, Where are the friendship lasers? Okay, now that is something Grenda would say. But before we get into the fight, I'd like to point out that this is Luis Cruz's least favorite episode he's ever worked on. I actually asked him about this before recording my lines, and he said that it doesn't have that much to do with the animation quality itself. Rather, his gripes come from how miserable he felt when making it. He was experiencing a lot of program issues and a lot of crashes, having to constantly redo scenes and just overall not being proud of how he handled some of the animation. Likely because the fight was animated at 24 frames per second when the final video was rendered at 30. And he also said the same thing happened with Naruto vs Ichigo. Maybe that's why I didn't care for the episode that much. And maybe I should have used that wording when I talked about it, so mmm. In other words, all the issues he had were because of mistakes that he ended up doing during production. And he was also dealing with a few personal things during that time. And after revisiting the fight multiple times, I'm starting to see where those production errors started coming into play. Let's talk about the flashing lights real quick. Not a lot of people like these moments, and it's not too hard to see why. I mean, there's one second of flashing lights when Twilight summons Raven, and then there's two seconds during this beam struggle, and then there's seven seconds when Raven transforms into White Raven. That equals 10 seconds of flashing lights throughout the episode. Sporadically, I'm aware, and it's not as bad as other episodes with flashing lights. In fact, I think Naruto vs Ichigo was technically worse in that regard. But given how drastically the overlays change, it's not something you want. And then there's this vague scene where Twilight gets hit by Raven's soul self, but then we cut to the treehouse being on fire and Twilight teleports out of it, all completely fine. Pretty sure she was getting bodied by the soul self, but I guess she managed to teleport out of it? Oh well. That's the same issue with Twilight dodging all of these trees. And that's also the issue with White Raven getting a cameo, not even for a full second. And then Raven is back in base form? At least I think that's what happened? But aside from that, the animation itself isn't that bad. Aside from this weird looking CQC that Raven has, but it's not a major thing. However, I have bigger issues in the form of the writing of this episode. First of all, I don't like the setup. Twilight using transdimensional teleportation to summon Raven who's playing with ponies is pretty cute in concept, but that's what starts the fight. And this leads into what is arguably my biggest problem with the episode, at least in terms of things I don't hear too many people talking about, Raven's characterization. In this fight, she comes across as aggressive, pugnacious, and immediately emotional. And not only did the analysis say that she tries to hide her emotions to prevent Trigon from showing up, but from what I remember of her, she's not like this at all. Even in more dire situations, she's often portrayed as stoic, serious, and even pretty calm, at least when her emotions aren't being manipulated. But then again, you could say that this is mainly referring to Teen Titans Raven, and that the comics characterize her way differently. In some iterations, that is kind of true, and there are comic runs that do portray her in the same way that Death Battles characterize her here. And I've heard multiple people say that those comic runs are where Raven is at her worst in terms of writing. Oof. And I think that's the reason why I'm not too fond of her voice. I think it's clever that Rena chan gets to voice both characters, because they were both originally voiced by Tara Strong, and I appreciate her efforts to differentiate them as much as she could. But while that works pretty well for Twilight, not so much for Raven. In fact, let's do a little voice comparison real quick. Starting with how I'm used to hearing Raven sound, then to how she sounds in Death Battle, and then what I think her voice in Death Battle reminds me of. They're not demons. Let me show you one. Azeroth, Metreon, Synthos! That's my room. <sighs> Nobody goes in my room. <sighs> Here, doggy. Here, doggy, doggy. You saw nothing. Azeroth, Metreon, Synthos! Well, that was odd. Mannequins have no place in this world. They are a foreign presence that unbalances a most delicate equilibrium. Foolish boy. Everything's an illusion. Your hopes, your friends, your life itself. But if this thing doesn't bother you, 
cool, but personally, even without that context, it just doesn't sound at all like Raven to me, nor does it act like Raven. It's just a generic sorceress voice. And unlike in Sephiroth vs. Virgil, she doesn't get any cool lines that stand out to me in a good way. Again, Twilight Sparkle is fine, but she might be a little more cowardly than what I remember. I definitely remember her being way more stable than this when fighting other people. And on top of that, I'm pretty sure Twilight has a rainbow alicorn form or something, which they skim through in the analysis, which is lame, but I guarantee could play off of White Raven or at least Dark Raven. Sorry for asking for a half decent fight, Dan. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, that's being disingenuous. This fight does use plenty of spells in fun ways. Yes, a lot of it is telekinesis and lasers, but to be fair, that is generally how they fight. Raven uses some portal magic that has a decent sense of impact, magic that drains Twilight of her emotions, which is surprisingly really cool, and her soul self gets a bunch of uses. Not just being used as a battering ram, but also capturing Twilight and draining her of her powers. And it also includes this neat little shot. Meanwhile, Twilight uses some teleportation, force fields, transmutation, and her want it needed spell. Shoutouts to that spell in particular, which is what causes Raven to transform into her Dark Raven form. Okay, that's actually pretty brilliant, not gonna lie, Luis. And then the clutch transmutation at the end makes for a pretty good fake out, actually. But then you get to the death end. They can't have Starscream kill a pony, but they can have a DC Herald killing a pony. Okay. Memes aside, I'm not too keen on the death. The explosion is kind of impactful, but all we see is a twilight-shaped hole in the ground, and then Raven drops a quirky one-liner as if that's in tandem with how Death Battle portrayed her in this episode. I swear, this is like the one line that's in character, and they still made it look weird. How in the hell is that possible? And then the conclusion, again, it's right by its own logic, but man, it's just so lame. They vaguely state that their magic has an equal amount of win conditions, but that doesn't matter because Raven stat stomps anyways. Okay, that is actually the general consensus I've seen, at least at the time, but it would have been nice to know how Raven would be able to resist their magical abilities. I mean, come on, you could have at least how Twilight using her emotional manipulation on Raven would have been more harmful for her than it wouldn't have been. Also, you're really gonna focus damn near half the conclusion to calcing the soul self when it's an astral projection, and you've already proven that Raven is physically stronger? But then again, much like the fight, the conclusion makes us listen to Titans of Magic, which is a pretty underrated track. Yeah, it sounds like a Christmas song, but imagine not liking Christmas music. Cringe. But aside from that, 39 out of 100. I can't believe I'm ranking this lower than Black Panther vs. Batman. Alright, so for these bizarre stars... Ah! When I first watched this episode, I wasn't a JoJo fan. But 2019 onward, I think I've become a huge JoJo fan. I mean, my middle name does start with J-O after all. But I've never revisited this episode as a JoJo fan, so this experience was kind of interesting. And I think you might find it interesting too. Well then again, Boomstick says, Can she row? And then Wiz does it too? Ah. Oh! And that's just funny to me for no reason. But anyways, I don't mind the use of JoJo memes here. The to be continued fake out is kind of abrupt and happens way too early. Although I do like how Wiz is how bizarre gets no reaction from Boomstick. But showing the scene of me screaming Dio is unnecessary and halts the pacing a bit. But I don't think that they overuse the memes at all. If anything, they barely used any. I also like them making fun of the name origin of stands and overall, I think they were covered really well. Even saying that Star Platinum is talented at photorealistic art. You'll love to see it. And seeing them act skeptical of FTL JoJo is pretty amusing in hindsight given that in the next two JoJo episodes people would be mad at Death Battle for believing it, which to be fair, is still contentious depending on who you ask. And this episode was also not written by Liam, so maybe the writer of this episode didn't believe FTL JoJo? Who knows? As for Kenshiro's rundown, it is better. They made Hokuto Shinken sound like an awesome fighting style, covering everything it can do from its offensive abilities to its non-lethal capabilities. Although the Munso Tensei bit would have had more weight to it if they elaborated on the loss that happened in Kenshiro's life, but it's no big deal. Oh, and Kenshiro's end clip is perfect. It comes out of nowhere, and it's probably the most abrupt ending in the show so far because they kind of forgot to add his weaknesses. I'll let you determine whether that's a good or a bad thing. I need to watch Fist of the North Star, though. Where can I watch it? Seriously. But let's get into the fight, and oh my lantern, that's hideous! People often say that the star finger is the worst looking shot. Really? Worse than Kenshiro's long face? Or Jotaro's death scene? Or Jotaro's ugly ass point? Oh, and also Joseph did not need to be here. He shouts, oh no, when a car shows up and constantly interrupts the fight with the quirky one-liner. Oh! 
Maybe this was where the JoJo meme criticisms applies. And I get, I get it. I reckon people would think that to be almost as annoying as a YouTube ad break interrupting a YouTuber during his sentence. Don't you just hate it when that happens? But anyways, once the fight starts, it immediately starts off with the Oro Oro thing versus the ah, ta, 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 ta thing. And no, you are not even worthy of a standing here meme. Not even the kazoo version. And skipping ahead just a bit, the death feels so limp because you see Kenshiro get that one hit he needs for later. It's just straight up right there. And instead of being portrayed as the Uno reverse card moment that both series are iconic for, at that point the viewer's just gonna be waiting for when Jotaro dies. What they should have done is have this clash closer to the end, with Kenshiro's shirt off, FYI. And once it ends, you cut to a scene where Kenshiro sneaks in that hit. I mean, come on, his DBX against Saitama did that. And if I had to compare anything to that, then that's not a good sign as to what score this episode's gonna be getting, isn't it? And then you have the illusion army scene where Star Platinum is fighting all of them at once, and Jotaro tries to dodge them all by... moonwalking, I guess. On top of that, their abilities in general just aren't used as interestingly as I would have liked. Most notably with the time stop. I mean, I like the first time stop, that was a pretty interesting use and is something Jotaro would do, but the second one... <sighs> Okay, I think I know what they were going for. They wanted to show that Kenshiro was prepared for the time stops and used his intangibility to screw over the second time stop. But they also try and frame it as if Jotaro was trying to phase through his body and go for his heart, which he never does in the time stop. But if the intangibility thing applies, it works better if he was using it as a last resort. It, it's such a confusing scene and kind of out of character for Jotaro. But this fight's got some cool stuff as well. I like Jotaro walking through Kenshiro's ranged attacks, and aside from the limp reveal and the bad hand-drawn moments, I think the death is pretty decent. Kenshiro drops the funny line and Jotaro's last nani, and even Joseph's last line made the death even better for me. The one time a Jojo meme was in any way funny. They even have Jotaro saying yare yare daze playing in the outro clip. But then we get to the conclusion, and it's wrong by its own logic, because they seem to have forgotten about Jotaro's diamond punching feat from the analysis. Oops. And let's be real, Jotaro never stood a chance against Kenshiro by himself. Okay, and? The only times where Jotaro ever fights by himself is when Star Platinum is gone. But come on guys, you really couldn't have at least scaled Kenshiro to one of Rao's cloud splitting feats? So yeah, unfortunately, as a JoJo fan, this episode really, really let me down. Even harder than I did when I first watched it. And I surprisingly didn't think too much of it. Bon chagrin, 32 out of 100. Is this really supposed to be a fan favorite season? <laughs> Okay, there is something that I need to address with this episode immediately. Let's talk about how this episode was criticized for being a stomp. I mean, yeah, lots of matchups are criticized for being a stomp, and can we delete this rhetoric from the face of existence? Please say yes, because I failed to see why the answer should be no. But with this episode in particular, it got to a point where the Q&A for this episode was literally named, Was Crash vs. Spyro a Stomp? Knowing that this series has previously done Vegeta vs. Shadow, Thor vs. Raiden, Ragnar vs. Soul, Vader vs. Doom, Charizard vs. Agumon, Flash vs. Quicksilver, and three peak human Batman vs. superhuman matchups, one of which was in this season, mind you. And those are just the episodes that I think they got right. If we included the ones that I think they got wrong, without any debate that I've seen, then that includes Rogue vs. Wonder Woman, Bomberman vs. Dig Dug, Ivy vs. Orchid, Guts vs. Nightmare, Luigi vs. Tails, and Yang vs. Tifa. Not to mention that they would later do Optimus vs. Gundam, Ultron vs. Sigma, Roshi vs. Jiraiya, Thanos vs. Darkseid, the Mega Man Battle Royale, Whites vs. Mitsuru, Deadpool vs. The Mask, Genos vs. War Machine, Yoda vs. King Mickey, Shadow vs. Ryoko, Steven vs. Star, Link vs. Cloud, Goku Black vs. Reverse Flash, Korra vs. Storm, Harley Quinn vs. Jinx, Omni Man vs. Homelander, Magneto vs. Tetsuo, Excalibur vs. Raiden, Bond vs. Wix, SpongeBob vs. Super Friends Aquaman, and Chosen Undead vs. Dragonborn. They could have picked any of these episodes, but for some inexplicable reason, this episode is is the only episode that massively gets criticized for being a stomp. Why? I don't care if they put large building city block level crash against the planet busting Spyro. That's still not even half a percent close to the biggest stomp on this show. Hell, it's not even the third biggest stomp in this season. And I don't want to hear anyone crying about them lowballing Spyro because no, they did not. And let's not pretend that this episode never had a legacy behind it, which you can't say about other bigger stomps. Come on, people, be real. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's get to the one thing you really wanted to hear from me. 
The prelude is longer than usual to focus on the history of Sony's role in the console wars. I like that. That's All right, fine. Let's hear what Wiz has to say. But Crash isn't really dumb. He just lacks communication skills. He actually shows many symptoms of... Oh. All right, there has been a lot of discussion and controversy about this tangent from people who aren't even on the autism spectrum. So, uh, how about for just this one time we get some words from somebody that is on the spectrum? Just once? Look, I'm just tired of this community trying to speak for me and other people on the spectrum when they themselves aren't even on the spectrum. But I was looking forward to talking about this, so let's go! Personally, I have quite a few opinions on this, but I don't think it's the episode damning tangent that other people have made it out to be. After all, Wiz is a scientist, so I think it's reasonable for him to give headcanons in this sort of way where he's doing it from an analytical and scientific approach. Or at least it makes more sense for him to do it than Boomstick, for example. He doesn't say this with any intent of malice at all. I mean, sure, it's still a weird tangent to have in the first place, especially since this is a death battle episode, you don't have to do it unless if it's canon, which in the case of Spyro it apparently is, and they do point out that he has ADD. But his endgame is to say, yeah, Crash may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but look at all this other cool stuff he can do. Not so dissimilar to the whole Pinkie Pie situation, is it? However, speaking as someone who has autism and knows Crash Bandicoot as a character well enough, I don't think that I want to have my specific situation to be compared to someone whose entire purpose was to be, to quote Cat Icarus, a mute dumbass who was meant to pay tribute to other mute dumbasses in classic Warner Brothers cartoons. Or at the very least, autism was not on the mind of the creators at any point. So while I do stand that this tangent is 100% inoffensive, it can be pretty weird for someone like me me because I'm actually a really smart kid. And if you want to be that guy, I have Asperger's, even though Asperger's was literally made with autism symptoms in mind, but I do consider myself to be on the autism spectrum, especially since Asperger's was removed from the DSM over a decade ago. But at the same time, there's another angle to take this. I am the last person to say that you can't have headcanons for characters just because there's no confirmation for it. And the way that Wiz goes about it, at least from my experiences, isn't that different from how people come up with their own headcanons for characters. Of course, this is weird because Wiz is unironically trying to come up with one for <laughs> of all characters. Hell, I asked a buddy on Discord who, yes, is on the spectrum, and no, I'm not saying who he is because I respect his privacy. And this was basically his opinion as well. But then again, there are people with autism who do need guidance every once in a while. So instead of looking at this like, Wiz, what the f are you saying? They could look at it like, oh wow, I never thought about Crash that way. Though this does open the can of worms of people assuming that every character with the slightest bit of quirk is most likely on the autism spectrum, and I'm gonna give it to you straight, we need to stop doing this. I've always believed that this horribly generalizes autism during an era where we finally have an idea understanding what autism is supposed to be, let alone how to handle the subject more tactfully. But if someone with autism says that they see parts of themselves in a character like Crash Bandicoot, I think that's valid. After all, who am I to prevent people from trying to feel happy about their neurodivergence? Also, give Wiz some credit. His analysis may be flawed, but at least he's going into specific details instead of just saying, oh hey, Crash doesn't talk, so he's gotta have autism, or something like that. I guarantee you, if Crash vs. Spyro was a season one or even a season two episode, I think that they would have approached it like this. But Crash is illiterate, doesn't know left from right, and has an incredibly severe case of ADHD. And that's the best case scenario, because keep in mind that this was during a time where they showed no restraint in using ableist slurs. Now, I'm not saying you can't have an opinion on this if you're not on the spectrum. I can understand why people would be weirded out like this. Rather, I'm trying to say that we should prioritize hearing from the opinions of people who are on the spectrum than those who aren't. Any other fellow autists in the chat want to give me their two cents on this whole tangent? I'm all ears, and if anyone has any respect for me or my videos, I'm sure they will too. With that in mind, I personally think that this whole autism thing completely detracts from the episode when it really doesn't need to. Because personally, I think that Crash's rundown has plenty of other stuff to enjoy. I mean, it does have plenty of cute little jokes like the potato gun joke, Boomstick calling out Aku Aku's inconsistency and bad parenting, and the stuff about bandicoots with Boomstick thinking they're cute. I don't know, I just like Boomstick saying that cute animals look cute. 
and this is one of the only times where I think it's perfectly fine to composite Crash. Well, for the most part. I don't think they needed to include stuff from the Titans games, outside of this one feat here, of course. I only say this because they include Crash's mojo abilities, only to say that they don't have any impact on the verdict. So it's all like, what was even the point of bringing it up in the first place? But of course, Spyro's analysis is better, especially with the way they go about the compositing issue. Look, I've never played the Legend of Spyro trilogy, so maybe some Spyro fans in the comments could elaborate on what they say about all three versions of Spyro are the same, and the Skylanders theory boomstick mentions, but whenever they bring up feats outside of Legend of Spyro, they use feats that are not too far-fetched to give him. And there are some other fun moments like the Aether versus Convexity Breath debate, the reveal that Spyro was adopted had a good delivery, especially with Boomstick's confusion afterwards, the Atom Smasher is surprisingly brilliant, learning about what it does was fascinating, but after they bring up that the light was stated to be as bright as a thousand suns, they play a clip of Spyro saying that he felt like he had the power of a thousand suns? That's just a smart way of using media clips. And then it has Spyro's end clip acting as Spyro's honest reaction to Wiz mentioning the power of love. <laughs> but as for the fights, I'd like to point out that there are two original tracks for this episode. The first one, Off Brandicoot, is a straightforward percussion piece that includes a marimba, the second best instrument behind the vibraphone, and one of the most fun to learn and perform, as I can confirm and other drum instruments that reference the percussive beats of Spyro music. It doesn't play for very long, but I like it. But then we get to the second piece, Crash and Burn, and this is literally everything I would want in a track for this matchup. Marimbas, guitars, high energy with a moderate tempo, even a cool organ breakdown, yes! But of course a good track can only carry a fight for so long, and it does start off with Spyro calling him weird, and apparently there are other people who have used this as a means of making the autism tangent worse. Really guys, don't, don't do this. He's very obviously referring to some giant two-legged walking orange marsupial destroying boxes for no reason. In fact, that's a running theme with this animation, being weirded out by seeing Crash weaponizing fruit, as well as randomly finding giant mechs and helicopter packs. Personally, I wish that the setup would have been something like Crash breaking a bunch of boxes and Spyro burning a flock of sheep while also breaking some pots, with one of those pots maintaining a magical gem, and they both fight over it since gems are key collectibles in both of their series, but that's just something I would have liked. The setup it's fine. It's, it's fine. I think this fight has some really fun choreography, like Crash dashing up the mountain to get a sneak attack while Aku Aku dispels the fire breath. I mean, it doesn't work, but it's smart. It's a clever maneuver. And I also like the reference to the chase levels from Crash Bandicoot, even if it's a little slow for my liking, but the impact that Spyro's fireballs leave in the ground is really cool. Then once Crash randomly stumbles across his mech, which is just such a Crash Bandicoot thing, <laughs> things start to get a tiny bit worse. Just because I don't think Crash is very smart for walking backwards towards a cliff, when he could easily just walk forward. I mean, I assume that he went for the mech to have a more fighting chance against Spyro's abilities. I do like Spyro using his ice breath and then going into his bowling boulder. Even if the takeoff would have benefited from more impact, the VFX of the ice breath look pretty nice, and the boulder does have a good sense of speed. And then we get to the aerial fight, and... They work in Crash's Death Tornado Spin as a reference to Ken's Guren Engine Kyaku. <laughs> I love it! But then Dark Spyro just randomly comes out and kind of shits on Crash a little too much. But I don't mind the death. I mean, yeah, there are people who say Crash should have done literally anything, but to find this literally anything, because, uh, his helicopter pack is destroyed, he doesn't have any other vehicles to retreat to, and he's not usually bothered to falling into water unless if there are carnivorous plants or sharks within them. And yet there are other people who have also tried using this as a means of making the autism tangent look worse. Like, guys, stop it! Knock it off! Seriously! But otherwise, yeah, this is actually a pretty great episode. 78 out of 100. I would have liked a better setup and some more fun exchanges of abilities, but otherwise, I disagree with the vitriol this episode gets at times. It's almost like there's not much use in freaking out over one arbitrary part of a 20-minute video. <laughs> All the Pit Boys in the Smash Brothers Pit Discord. You can shut up about this episode now. <laughs> Y'all have no idea how excited I was to see Pit, my all-time favorite Nintendo character alongside Wolf O'Donnell from Star Fox, entering Death Battle. Plus, I was just getting into Kingdom Hearts at the time, so I was hyped to see Sora as well, but I mean, come on, Pit is my son! 
When will voice acting projects hire me to voice Pit one time? I would love to do that, seriously. I've done voice acting in the past. You don't know me. This does make me kind of sad that Kingdom Hearts music can't be played, but copyright really be like that. But that said, I don't think that the poppy music they use fits Sword's rundown at all, even if Kingdom Hearts also has some cheery music, but it's best known for its orchestral tracks, so it would have been nice to hear some more stock orchestral music, at least. But aside from that, they cover the convoluted stuff of Kingdom Hearts mostly well. I like how they established Don Donald and Goofy as world hoppers. And my favorite part of the analysis is Wiz explaining nobody's to Boomstick. I could just picture Wiz putting up a graph to explain it like in the Charlie Day meme. And Boomstick's follow-up is pitch perfect. Honestly, this is infinitely better than saying, Well, uh, I don't want to do basic research on this series, so I'm, uh, I'm just gonna assume that no one knows and also gaslight fans of the series into thinking it's bad. Seriously, how does anyone find enjoyment out of Ragnar's analysis? I really don't get it. Some people take issue with Sora not having access to to his drive forms. I've heard that he can use at least one drive form by himself, and that Donald and Goofy being absent is just a gameplay mechanic, but oh well, I still like it. Honestly, the biggest issue I have is that they refer to Xehanort as Xanort. Like, what? But anyways, on to Pit's analysis. <laughs> oh, this is a fun time. But I'm sorry, I'm still not over the whole lightning thing. Oh my, oh my god. Look, look, look. I have no reason to complain about this because this was over five years ago, and the existence of Kingdom Hearts 3 makes this whole speed difference completely bunk. But I mean, come on, how in the hell could you have not at least name-dropped Phosphora? The fact that the community during the time of the Q&A was unironically more concerned about Sora using a slightly different means of dealing with Pit's projectiles than Pit having multiple lightning dodging feats has got to be one of, if not the biggest L that I can give the death battle community. Why did no one ask about this during the Q&A? I don't get it. That, that's really my main issue. Did nobody else think this was weird? But again, I can get over that because I love Pit's analysis so much. It may not be as engaging as the typical Season 2 analysis, but it's just as entertaining, if not more so. The 25 years ago gag has good timing, the Captain N reference made me laugh out loud, and then there's this line in the sidebar, and the My Cabbages clip... Okay, it didn't need to be there, but you have other moments like Boomstick being upset over Pit's wings not working. And then the dead man line, the Dinto's Mentos joke, they reference floor ice cream, yes! I mean, like with Soul's analysis, they kind of do prioritize making jokes over making Pit look like a cool character. And I do wish that they mentioned some of his key qualities like his optimism, his unrelenting bravery, his naivete. I mean, I guess the ending note technically references, but not to a point where any outsiders know what part of the story they're referring to. However, it's still better than Soul's analysis because they evidently give a shit about the world of Kid Icarus and try to entice the viewer as opposed to making it look interesting at first and then cutting it to, Oh hey, it's just another Super Soldier project! Okay, I've been using this voice too much and it's starting to hurt my throat. And then not bother with the world building for the remainder of the analysis. But the music they go with, yes, this is the orchestral vibe I have been looking for in Sora's analysis. And I love Pit's end clip so much. Not only is it one of his best lines, but they also make it similar to Sora's end clip where it focuses on light overcoming darkness. And then with all of this in mind, I was super excited to get into the fight. Especially since so many people were saying, yeah, I used to think this episode is mid, but it's a lot better than I remember. It's really good. I heard wrong! This episode is still kind of lame. I'm sorry. Ugh. That disappoints me because there are genuinely fantastic elements. Justin Brenner's Pit is excellent. I've heard that this is just his Deku voice, but it fits really well with Pit, and all of his line readings are impeccable. I mean, it's kind of lame that Sora doesn't banter with Pit at all, but in their defense, Sora isn't the type to banter in the same way, and for being Bryce Pappenbrook's only role in the show, he does a good job. And of course, Unlocking Heaven is a good track. Even if Brandon's cat destroyed one of his mixing monitors during the production, I like the Kid Icarus Uprising influence it has, and the way they utilize the Kingdom Hearts leitmotif. But despite all of these good things, I still have some major issues with it. The first part of the fight is really slow, with the projectiles coming out so lethargically, and somehow they move even slower over time. It feels less like a fast-paced battle from Kingdom Hearts or a high-octane air battle in Kid Icarus Uprising, and more like watching a turn-based RPG. Enemy A attacks, enemy B dodges, enemy A does another action, enemy B does another action. That's just not fun, nor is it fitting of these two characters as source materials. And then you have this scene where Pit uses his Guardian Orbitars to slowly reflect the fireball, and then Sora uses a very slow Firaga to dispel it instead of trying to reflect it himself. But the biggest issue I have with this fight is the same issue I have when re-watching my old Smash Brothers competitive VODs. STOP USING UPPER DASH ARM! 
Like, I swear, people actively gaslit me into thinking that Pit uses a lot more than just his smash moveset. Yeah, if by a lot more, you mean literally just a few shots of the easy cannon and a vague use of a bomb. Not to mention that Pit used his upper dash arm multiple times in the fight, knowing that he could easily use literally any other weapon. Boomstick outright mentions that his favorite part of Pit's arsenal were the tattoos that can shoot lasers. Is this gonna be a regular thing? Boomstick going over his favorite part of a character's arsenal only for the fight to just not use it at all? I mean, I guess if you want to count the three sacred treasures, given that it's not his final Smash anymore, but it was in Smash Wii U, which was the latest Smash game during the time of this episode, so personally, I don't. It completely does f*** all anyway. Like, <laughs> Anyways, getting ahead of myself. They do let Sora use some of his arsenal. He uses fire, teleportation, I think? But he also does use Ragnarok, Sonic Blade, Stopka, Gravica, and the Keyblade Beam, and yes, it's an attack. It's just not used in Sora's gameplay. But going into the death, I know that the three sacred treasures getting one shot is lame, especially since it's before Pit does anything with it. But I love the attention to detail of Pit losing his wings as he dies. How has no one been talking about this? That's such a nice touch! Overall, it's a lot like Fox vs. Bucky, where I have a lot of passion for this episode. It introduces one of my all-time favorite characters they've used, with one of my favorite character rundowns of all time, but the fight lets me down with how dull and slow some of it is. So I do like this episode because of Pit alone. Lowballing aside, they did my boy justice! But I just expected both characters to do way more with their powers, especially for Pit. I'm giving it the same score I gave Fox vs. Bucky, 59 out of 100. Pretty good, but at the same time, Pit vs. Zagreus when... And here we go to the second asterisk of the season. This fight was more or less in the top 15% rather than the top 10%, but that's because Torian really wanted to do this episode. Though eventually, due to time constraints, resources, or whatever the Road to 100 blog entry says, I genuinely can't remember off the top of my head right now, it got moved to the 2D team. But then again, if it did get moved to the 3D team and it was released this early on, Crash vs. Spyro would have been a sprite fight, and nobody would have wanted that. But the analyses communicated to me that the team did want to make this episode. Leon's analysis was pretty good. The music made it engaging enough, even if the jokes were just okay, but the Gene Simmons reference caught me off guard. Funny how it's in the context of a liquor only for Simmons to go through a sexual assault scandal two months after this episode. <laughs> you can't make this up! I literally just found out about that while writing the script. <laughs> Talk about weird timing. And it's not super relevant, but I like how they calc the shark bite in tons of force, knowing that they could have easily used PSI instead, but I'm glad they didn't. But Frank's analysis was a lot better than I remember. I mean, they say the funny line twice. twice. You can't go wrong with that. And the other jokes were pretty good, except for the Stephen Hawking one. That's pretty cringe, not gonna lie, Boomstick. But the way they handled the silver ghost bit was on point. I also like how they covered his rise and fall of fame and his zombie phase, and I've always liked how they discussed the no sleep and no rest feat. Given that Frank is honestly one of the weakest characters that Death Battles ever used, let's not sugarcoat it, hearing them discuss an endurance feat like this is so refreshing as opposed to other characters getting, they punch this thing this hard. It's not a problem, but it makes moments like these all the more special. In fact, Frank steals the show in the fight as well. His expressions are fantastic, and Austin Lee Matthews' take is really good. It's not the same as Rotolo's, but instead of being like Twilight, it's more like Virgil, where he may not sound like Frank, but he acts like Frank. At least from what I know of the character, it's a cross between his classic voice and his Dead Rising 4 voice, and the delivery of his puns is really endearing. I also like the camera flash with the pick of his middle finger. <laughs> that is so Frank to me. Although this punt he does has too much impact for my liking, because it feels like Leon stopped tumbling after a quick bounce, and then in the next shot he's rolling so damn fast. A quicker cut would have fixed this issue. But then we get to the zombie outbreak scene, and there is a lot going on here. Leon is actually trying to pick them off one by one, but Frank is so focused on creating one of his unique weapons that when they do close in on Frank, it's actually kind of tense. <laughs> nice job on bumping up the lighting and letting it linger for a bit. It makes the impact of Frank unleashing it that much better. And I also love the part where Frank kicks Leon's shotgun in the air and then Leon holds him off with his Sistema before catching his shotgun to kill a zombie. That's just so slick and stylish, my dude. But there is this weird cut to where Frank teleports a further distance away. I get that he was chasing down some other zombies, but it feels like he should have been closer to Leon's position. But at the same time, Leon's using a lot of swift movements, which ties into the conclusion pointing out his greater speed, where he's able to dodge Frank's 
Frank's attacks and the zombies' attacks at the same time. And at first I thought that Frank barely attacking the zombies and seeing them reuse animations for Frank multiple times was bad, but then I realized that Leon was using multiple faster attacks and movements. So this was yet another subtle way of demonstrating Frank's vastly inferior experience and mobility. And of course, you have the covered wars exchange, with Leon giving a perfect response. I mean, what more is there to say? It's just that good. There's a reason why everyone considers it the best part of the episode. Except for me, because I kind of prefer everything with the zombies, but this is easily a close second. In fact, this episode is chock full of minor details that I appreciated over time. I like how they use the arcade machines outside the mall as the Chekhov's gun, as opposed to the actual gun that flies away from Frank. Oh, and this shotgun falls on the ground the exact moment that Leon falls on the ground, making his fall even more impactful than it would be otherwise. Especially with the creative sound design used by those nifty new sound engineers. Oh. And then you have the exosuit scene, with its appearance having another great use of lighting being in dark shadows, and the ice tornado ending is really good, especially with how Resident Rising accentuates this moment extremely well, giving a chilling atmosphere. Combine that with the excellent sound design for the zombie freezing over as well as Leon struggling to deal with the ice as it freezes his feet, and then you have a really, really badass moment perfect for an epic kill, but nope, it's just Leon using a rocket launcher to kill Frank. So uh, that's how it ends. Frank doesn't even move out of the way. I do like how Zombie Frank gets a cameo in the outro clip before they immediately show a black box that basically says that Zombie Frank had no influence in the matchup. But with the conclusion, I was originally weirded out by how they show a black box that says Leon has used plenty of creative thinking, only to at most immediately say that he's shown plenty of creative thinking a strategy mid-fight, which is kind of unnecessary. But then you remember that this is what they base their conclusion around, and that is demonstrated wonderfully through not just the animation thing I brought up earlier, but also through smaller moments like Leon chucking a zombie corpse in reaction to Frank's Mega Buster, and the previously mentioned hopping off of the frozen zombie corpse to escape the ice tornado. Also, the way that the zombies are used here is surprisingly clever, conveying that these wacky gadgets of Frank's can easily kill Leon if he gets a good hit with them. And the conclusion also points out how there are multiple moments where Leon has defeated mutants and zombies that could easily one-shot him, and he's had to rely on his experience and creative thinking mid fight to live another day. And that's exactly what's happening here as well. Yes, the zombies were also dying to simple knives and gunshots, but keep in mind that Leon was mostly getting hit by some of Frank's less powerful arsenal. Definitely enough to hurt him, but not enough to kill him right then and there. Either way, it goes to show that the zombies really do make this episode so much better than it otherwise would be. Going from a simply alright episode to a great one. Genuinely among the most underrated episodes of the show, alongside Ryu versus Hiryu and Ken versus Terry, but I can kind of see why people don't talk about it that much. It's arguably the least popular matchup of the season, especially since even episodes like Sora vs. Pit were getting more requests than the likes of Galactus vs. Unicron. But I think you should definitely consider giving this episode another chance, because I'm giving it an 86 out of 100. The only issue is that the kill is underwhelming and Leon's analysis was nothing special, but with Frank's rundown being much better and the fight being a lot more impressive than on the surface level, I say that this is most definitely not a resident sleeper. I guess looking back, Season 5 had plenty of season disappointment, with this one being the first major case of it. You know that this matchup is complex when Ben outright says that their research couldn't even justify how powerful they are. Though I would have liked the music to quiet down a bit, the audio mixing is still fine. Plus, when it comes to these two, I'm not looking for jokes. I'm not even looking for that much backstory or background information. I want to hear all about their powers and feats, and to that extent, I think they did a good job. But the Boomstick ex-wife joke is cringe. But thankfully we have some not cringy jokes, like Bolsa ball sack and the divide by zero joke. And the acts of Angarumus or whatever. Acts of Angarumus, it's really not that difficult to say. And I like Fate's analysis as well. For being one of my all-time favorite DC characters, I think they did a good job. They even made it seem like he had a chance against Strange until you see that this says infinite multiverse. And they didn't give that same scaling to Strange. So gee, I wonder who's going to win. Oh, and a boomstick dad joke? Oh, sure. But as for the fight, there is the claim that they barely use any magic, but I don't fully agree with it. I mean, I'm not here to deny that it's wasted potential, as the only spells that Dr. Fate uses are Summoning Pillars, True Fate, his Pocket Dimension, even though it was technically Strange who activated it, and it's also the exact same environment as Jotaro vs. Kenshiro. 
for some reason, and some lasers. Unless if he was the one that caused any dimensional travel. But Strange, however, was using a pretty healthy amount of spells. Sure, technically none of it fit the theme of the matchup, that being reality warping on a grand scale, but he still uses more than people give him credit for. He uses the Bolts of Balthak, the Flames of the Faultine, Teleportation, Waterbending, an unknown incantation, the Crimson Bands of Sidorak, Dimensional Travel, and Astral Projection. More magic would have been nice, but I think they included quite a bit. Though again, I agree that Fate could have done a lot more than just throwing hands and tackling Strange. The real problem I have with this fight is the dimensional travel scene where they go to all of these weird locations and do f**k all with them. Except for this one moment where Strange is manipulating the water to prevent himself from drowning, which is actually really cool, especially when it's implied that it's used as a portal to the Moe's Aisley Cantina. But then again, you realize that this is the only real sense of reality warping we get in the entire episode, and yeah, I can understand where the criticism comes from even if I don't fully agree with it. We do get some cool stuff when they get up on the dragon's back. Most notably, some really nice looking hand-drawn shots, like seriously jerky, go off! And I also like Strange using his cloak and the Crimson Bands to take off Fate's helmet, only for Fate's helmet to just zoom all the way back around, referencing the one feat from the analysis, and nearly everything to do with True Fate is awesome. Infinite gender and all. I mean, his very presence being too much for Strange is just really cool. But then again, I did say nearly everything is awesome because the death is just a lame-ass disintegration of his astral projection, but he decided to skip the one leg and just disintegrate the entire body along with it. Okay, sure. But now I'd like to talk about Strange Fate, which is a really good and unique track that uses a large variety of synths and instruments to match the setting they travel to, and to match the variety of spells that they have at their disposal. It's something that I think the remaster to commemorate Wanda vs. Zatanna kinda lacks in. Don't get me wrong, it is better, but it mostly uses the same synths and guitars throughout, though the use of the sitar in both versions is phenomenal. But anyway, there is a common criticism that complex matchups like this one are doomed to have weak conclusions, and yeah, I'm definitely gonna go back to this later, but with conclusions like this, I'm wondering if that's actually the case. They were able to cover the fundamentals of the matchup with their argument being that Fate has more experience, more reliable magic by virtue of being able to cast spells non-verbally, and is way faster. And from what I understand, this was the common opinion as to why Fate won. I mean, yeah, it is kind of ruined by the whole infinite multiverse thing, but otherwise, I think that this conclusion is really good, even if it's not as long as, say, Naruto vs. Ichigo's, for example. I also like the little note they end on with Strange borrowing the powers of a god and Nabu being a god borrowing the body of a man. Overall, I'm gonna give this episode a 70 out of 100. I know that that's basically a 7 out of 10, but this is the lowest possible 7 out of 10 I can give. And even if I don't fully agree with all of the issues, I still agree with some of them. But I didn't think that the potential was as wasted as other people say it is, but that criticism comes much, much later. <laughs> And here we have the final episode to have Torian as a lead animator, with Blake vs. Mikasa being his last episode overall, but that was due to him being a part of Rooster Teeth's in-house 3D animation team. And given how other animators and even writers left off on a note that wasn't the most ideal, coupled with this episode having some controversy behind it that I will address in a way, how good is this episode? Well, Ryu's analysis wasn't as funny as I wanted it to be, but I do think it was tough to top that episode's humor and this episode has all of this nifty new footage of Street Fighter V that actively expands on Ryu's journey, so it's fitting how the analysis ditched the humorous side and makes a more serious analysis out of it, focusing on his rivalry with Akuma and how Ryu overcomes the Satsui no Hado. It's a nice change of pace that helps the analysis stand out from his previous episode, and even then they still sneak in a couple of gags here and there like Boomstick wanting to have kids he cares about, and name them after some of the Satsui no Hado's translations. The music choices they use to highlight parts of Ryu's journey are really good. So yeah, good job on making a returner's analysis stand out from his previous one. Now let's see what they were able to do with his opponent, which finally debuts Tekken on the show. Not sure what took him this long, nor do I understand why there are only two Tekken episodes despite being just as big as the other fighting games, but Jin's analysis is the one where all the quips went to, and I like some of them, like Boomstick's delivery of Nancy, and the tangent about Boomstick's dog eating Wiz's devil gene chewables, but otherwise it wasn't quite as engaging as I would have wanted it to, but it was still fine. But anyways, let's move on to the fight, and okay, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, 
I've been doing Torian hella dirty during this series. Yes, I have been praising damn near all of his episodes, but I was never able to really capture what made his episodes so good. I was able to highlight Jordan Lange's sense of speed, Zach Watkins' technical prowess, and even Louis Cruz's knack for pacing and humor. But I was never really able to do that for Torian, despite arguably being the most iconic animator in Death Battle history. But then again, I think that this fight, fittingly enough, is the best way to describe his animation style. His two best traits are his engaging choreography and dynamic camera tracking. Of course, his animations have some signatures, like some fast flips, counter holds, slow-mo shots, and this genre of kicks. But Torian is a master of enticing hand-to-hand -hand combat that maintains the energy with tight camera tracking and smooth cuts. I mean, yeah, the beginning does have a choppy frame rate, but given that it's supposed to be low energy with Ryu training, it's not a big deal. Plus, it gets saved by the smooth transition with the 2D smoke and the red lightning effects as a color boost back up. And then the fight starts, and we have Torian's simple choreography being enhanced further by the enticing camera work and back and forth, making it feel even at first. But then we get the Daigo parry, and YOU KNOW THIS IS WORTHY OF A STANDING HERE MOMENT! Plus with the way that the background gets darker as Ryu counters with his Hadouken and his Shinku Tatsumaki is GORGEOUS! Mm, brilliant use of color correction indeed! Way better than in Metal Sonic vs. Zero! And the Shinshoryuken is good, but its impact isn't as good as it is in Ryu vs. Scorpion, just because I think this one's a little rushed given that it's immediately cancelled into from his Shinku Tatsumaki, but then again it's framed almost exactly like in Street Fighter 4, so I'll ignore it. Honestly, I think that the biggest issue overall is that Jin's devil form transformation comes a bit too early, and his out of my way line feels a bit out of place, but it's still a good transformation scene, especially with Jin's earlier line being, I shall show you Oh yeah, remember in Ryu vs. Scorpion where they used voice lips in a way that created the illusion of voice acting? They do that here as well. In fact, aside from that one moment, I think this episode does it better. You can do better than that. Come on. I shall show you. And then Jin uses his rage art, at least I think that's his rage art, to slam Ryu into the Haven Academy vault from Ruby. Okay, it doesn't fit, but it's still a fun location, so I can get over it. Oh, but the evil Ryu transformation. Oh my gosh, this is astounding. The way that it sings with the music coupled with the impact of the aura appearing. Oh my gosh, the, the, <laughs> I cannot find a word to use for this anymore. At least not without repeating myself, because it really is astounding. And then Evil Ryu's scream has even more impact than anything in Hulk vs. Doomsday. I will never apologize. And then the fight gets even more and more intense as they're fighting on a f***ing boulder, with Ryu just outright kicking him into one. And then the atmosphere from the music making it even more tense, wow. And then we get to the death, which, okay. I get some of the criticisms that it gets. We don't even see Jin getting hurt. Like, yeah, we see blood, but that's kind of hard to see with this wide shot here. And although you can kind of see the hole in Jin's chest, you really can't. But at the same time, are you seeing all of this? Call it an ass pull? I'm gonna call you wrong. It's a subtle callback to Ryu tapping into the Satsui no Hado as Jin was stomping on his face. You know, the part where Ryu is getting his face stomped by Devil Jin to a point where he's literally being pushed to activate the Satsui no Hado. This moment works as a callback to that because instead of further embracing the Satsui no Hado, like what Akuma would want, he instead decides to collect himself where literally nothing is noticeably lit on screen and then he activates Muno Ken, which is also supported in the conclusion with how Ryu has better control over his evil form than Jin does. Put your hate boner away, we're gonna get to that part soon. Instead of being an asshole like what other people have made it out to be, this is supposed to be a reflection at how much Ryu has mastered Muno Ken. And the music, again, sells this even more, with the beat dropping out entirely. And also the way he just pushes Jin away from him, coupled with the guitar solo just going hard? And then the massive Shinku at Duken getting this sense of scale? Are we looking at the same death scene? Ha! Huh, this is amazing, and... and... okay. There is one thing that I need to address. Fight Like a Devil is my favorite track in all of Death Battle. The instrumentals? Perfect! Perfect. The flow of the lyrics? Amazing! The energy? It's low energy when it needs to be, but when it needs to be higher, it goes so high and I love it to death! The way it fits the fight? Sublime! See Evil Ryu's transformation and the ending. In fact, classic 2018 Jonathan Frost is in combo video mode. Go! It's a war. Lift your hands. Power up to see who can stand. Strike in a roar from the fans. Who can win with who's in command? And no. Con
copyright in the universe is going to stop me from loving this track! Also, it's not my fault that Brandon and Therwolf refuse to upload the instrumental versions of their tracks for no f***ing reason. Okay, but now let's talk about that conclusion. People think this episode is wrong, and I'll let you guys keep thinking that, but I don't agree with all of the reasons they use. Specifically with the meteor feat saying, Oh, that was Shinakuma who broke the meteor! As if Ryu doesn't have a form that is comparable to Shinakuma. Let's go into the actual issues that I haven't seen a lot of people talk about. For one, they just outright composite Ryu and choose not to do the same for Jin. Especially with this line right here. Well, it's unsupported by canon material. I like to think that what Wiz was saying was that there's not enough canon feasts to justify scaling Jin to the Jack robot. Although Heihachi vs. Geese does kind of make this point completely worthless. But this goes into the compositing thing where they choose to composite one character but not the other. I mean, they don't fully composite him, as doing so would basically scale him to Asura from Asura's Wrath. And I'm pretty sure even the most biased Tekken wankers won't even try to justify Tekken being anywhere close to Asura. Their main argument is that he was able to beat Akuma using the Street Fighter 3 manga, which is non-canon. Granted, I don't think it's completely unreasonable to give him some scaling to Akuma, but they say that Ryu can scale to him in base form, which in the canon games, he's never been able to hold his own against him outside of the Satsui no Hado. And Muno Ken, of course. And this is where we get into criticism number two. They never elaborate on how much stronger Muno Ken makes Ryu, and it's sad when you remember that several other transformations and such were given multiple pliers in episodes before and since. Given that they say Ryu in base form is still higher than Jin's highball, it would have been nice if they tried to give a multiplier for Muno Ken. Remember when they mentioned he beat Seth? Well, his strongest attack in base form did literally nothing, but then a simple attack from Muno Ken literally incapacitated him. So it's very obviously a significant multiplier. Could this still compete with the team putting composited Tekken characters at Continental? I don't know. But either way, while I do admire the effort that was put into the conclusion, especially since they knew they were gonna go with the unpopular opinion, it still has some fundamental issues that I can't bring myself to ignore. But otherwise, solid rundowns, impeccable animation, godlike music, and an underrated kill make it enough for me to give this episode a 97 out of 100. Quite possibly the best ending note that anyone on the Death Battle team has had on this show. Yet it's not even the best episode of the season. <laughs> Yes, I made a custom thumbnail for this episode, what of it? This is a very special episode, not just to me, but to Death Battle as a whole. Yet ironically, this episode wasn't even planned for this season. Luis made a drunken promise that he would make a hand-drawn Samurai Jack episode for season 5 by himself. I don't even think he was referring to Jack vs. Afro specifically. Ben kinda laughed it off because he knew that Louise was drunk, but Louise was serious about this. Ben eventually let him do this, but informed him that he would have to do nearly all of the work on his own, because they wouldn't be able to collab with someone like Blind Ferret on such short notice. I'm pretty sure he got some help on the backgrounds from people like Jerky, for example, but he still did it. All within five weeks, apparently. You see, people, you don't need all this worthless junk like AI art, deep fakes, voice cloning, whatever the f***. Just get an actually talented animator drunk so that he decides to do some insane projects all by himself to a point where he has to push himself to keep going. And that's how Ragnar vs. Velvet became an official Death Battle episode in Season 11. Stories like these inspired Ben to do the Road to 100 blogs in the first place, which I've been using as a source for a lot of the background context that I've been bringing up so far. And given how impressive this episode already is, I don't think you know what that means, kids. Because it means that it's time for the long awaited return of the fully scripted rundown! And just to add a little extra perspective, I actually got around to watching both Samurai Jack and Afro Samurai for the first time. I highly recommend both of them. Samurai Jack, I mean, of course it's great, but Afro Samurai is really good. It's a short and simple but effective story that says what it needs to. Elevated by gorgeous visuals, a god-tier soundtrack made by RZA, and Samuel L. Jackson giving the best performances of his entire life, don't at me. Actually, we all know that his best performance was in Pulp Fiction, let's be real. Oh, and side note, it's on Hulu, and it's only five episodes long, so at this point, you lack an excuse to not watch it. But I'm sure you've watched this episode and know why it's so good, right? Well, let's talk about what makes this episode so spectacular. 
The analyses may not have a lot for me to talk about, but I'm still gonna script them anyway. Jack's analysis was really fun. It starts with Aku's monologue from the opening of Samurai Jack, where Boomstick gets so into the reference that he forgets that he's supposed to be analyzing Jack. You see, Danny vs. Jake, this is how you make this joke funny. They also make a lot of fun references to the series and other characters while doing a great job at making his story engaging, most notably using the exact clips used when Jack first says what his name is. Jack! Jack was out! Jack! Jack! Yo, Jack! Jack was Jack! 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 And I like some of the other jokes as well. Sure, not all of them made me laugh, but none of them were bad. They all work and don't detract from the quality of the analysis, in my opinion. Just like when you spend four sleepless years struggling through college, and then find out too late that nobody cares about your English major. You should have chosen a more practical one, Wiz, like mine. Look, as someone who has three majors, with English being one of them, I should have gone into poultry science. Another moment I really like is when Boomstick makes a joke that says, Ha ha, the samurai knows ninjutsu! And then mumbles his, Ninja murai. But then Wiz instantly follows up with how it's been useful for Jack's fights, and then brings up a speed feat. Mm, that's gotta be one of the smoothest transitions from joke to feats they've ever done. And Afro's analysis is just as engaging and enjoyable. They cover the full history of the headbands, which helps set up his drive to kill Justice, and why he murdered Swordmaster. They also included the RPG in a motherfucking backpack clip. I can die happy. I also like some of their other jokes, like Boomstick's imaginary friend, and even the Boomstick's dad joke was decent. People also like to say that there's a Boomstick dad joke in Samurai Jack's analysis, but Sarge doesn't have a gun for his leg. I don't think that's what he's referring to. But before I accidentally force myself to do more tedious audio editing, let's go back to Afro's analysis and talk about a very minor problem I have. They show in his list of feats that he survived an RPG shell that's as strong as 72 tons of TNT, and then they make a calculation for it as if we couldn't see it for ourselves. But anyways, that's all my criticisms for the entire episode, and yes, I did say entire episode, because oh my lanta, this fight goes so f***ing hard. In fact, aside from the recent return to Crocodile Isle, this is probably my favorite YouTube animation, period. And I'm pretty sure that this is Louise's favorite episode he's ever worked on. Let's see why he thinks that. The first thing I need to bring up is the look of the fight. It's very much inspired by the Samurai Jack art style with its simplistic look and all. The environment is basically the same bridge from when Jack meets the Scotsman for the first time. Though, to be fair, the bridge setting is also the one used in the fight against Afro Droid, so it's not a one-sided reference. I also like how Afro appears out of the shadows once the Afro Samurai influence from the track kicks in. Again, being a direct reference to the Scotsman's first appearance. I think that this is one of the most clever references in the entire show. There are also many other references to Samurai Jack that are very close to the same level of creativity and wit as the I've been playing human line from Tony vs. Lex. I'll be covering at least some of them later on, but even if you don't notice this reference at first, it's just a really cool shot that paints Afro as a menacing opponent. And although he looks more like a character from Samurai Jack, he still has traces of his distinct art style with the thin lines, heavy shadows, and illusion of realism. Or at the very least, he looks more realistic than Jack does with his square head. But still, this is an excellent way of translating Afro Samurai's exquisite art style into Samurai Jack's iconic art style. I'll have more to say on the look of the fight later on, but let's talk about how the fight starts. Your sword smells of blood. And your smells of oil, what of it? Okay, on the surface, it's just one of those, hey, you cut me off, asshat. <laughs> Who cares? Type of setups. However, when looking at this from a metaphorical standpoint, or at least what it means in the context of these shows, this is literally the perfect setup one could come up with for this matchup. It wonderfully ties into one of the core themes of Afro Samurai, if not the biggest theme, the never-ending battle. Afro slaughtered so many people for revenge, but Jack, however, actively avoids killing others, vowing to protect them instead. But this doesn't mean that Jack's sword doesn't smell of blood either. He's killed other humans before, most famously in the final season where Jack is visibly horrified at the fact that he killed a human. That's even something he tries to run away from. So, we have two samurai who have traveled an arduous journey where some people have been slaughtered by their swords, with one samurai expressing disdain for blood being on his sword, and the other, not so much. What's the setup they go with? Your sword smells of blood. So does yours. Oh, 
Oh, oh, oh, that gives me chills now that I think about it. But then they start fighting, and despite being a mere two and a half minutes long and having little to work with, there's a lot to break down. There are plenty of moments where the aspect ratio subtly changes. Fights in Samurai Jack will often do this and even show panels of the fight scenes taking place, often to demonstrate how much progress has been made without making a fight drag on for too long. And in the death battle, they don't use it to the same extent, but it uses this technique in a different way that's equally effective. Much like with episodes such as Mewtwo vs. Shadow, wait, 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 bad example. Much like with episodes such as Shredder vs. Silver Samurai, Jack and Afro don't really land a lot of actual hits. A lot of it is merely sword clashes. This is where the aspect ratio changes come into play. The sword clashes have multiple perspective shots. Sometimes they show them fighting very close to the camera, and other times the camera is shot from afar. The aspect ratio is adjusted to help the viewer keep track of where they are fighting when the camera pans further away. It also helps add tension to attacks that you think would be an actual hit, highlight key moments in a fight, or to imply that the next attack is going to be really powerful whether or not it lands. There are other effects used as well, most notably those anime speed lines to convey a sense of speed, some being more subtle than others, but it's justified when it's not subtle. It tends to be smooth, but sometimes it isn't, though to be fair, it's not always smooth in Samurai Jack either. Not that the viewer would have any trouble keeping track of what's going on in the fight. This episode has some of the best keyframes of the entire show. You know how my favorite work of fiction will often fluctuate between being animated on ones to being animated on threes within the same fight scene? Or how pretty much the entirety of Spider-Verse is animated on twos, threes, and fours? Those represent the kind of style that Jack vs. Afro is going for, where more often than not, it's almost never animated on ones, more so being animated on twos, threes, and fours the entire time. But this fight uses twos, threes, and fours interestingly, specifically within the beginning clash. Both characters are being animated on different sets of frames, like when Jack is being animated on twos and threes, while Afro is being animated on fours. And yeah, if you end up pausing on a frame, you'll find something that looks out of place, but it's more than likely that this is not an animation error. It's more akin to one of those freaky fighting game frames you'd find in a fast or powerful attack where they do look weird when you pause on them, but when taken in context of the animation, it's vital to the speed and power of the animation. This is the kind of thing you see throughout the entire fight. Even when they're in silhouettes, due to their distinct hairstyles, the keyframes remain just as strong. I think that the best use of the aspect ratio and keyframes are when Jack loses his top knot. Here's the clip in question. <laughs> When this happens in the show, it's meant to convey that Jack is getting heated in a battle, and this episode treats it as the big deal it rightfully is, focusing on Jack's angry face just long enough for the viewer to register how his mindset has changed during the fight. Then his hair poofs outward and the aspect ratio closes in on Jack's face, just to accentuate such a drastic change for him. Jack and Afro change appearances over the course of the fight, with both eventually fighting shirtless because their swords are just that strong. Although, if I remember correctly, the only time Afro was shirtless in the show was when he was being cared for by Otsuru. But here, Afro kinda just yeets his clothes off, which technically works in the context of the fight since it's supposed to match how hard Jack is fighting during this part. So as we can see, this episode has a heavy Samurai Jack influence. Understandably so, since it's a far more popular series. However, there is some Afro Samurai stuff they include. Not only is the track more akin to the Afro Samurai soundtrack than it isn't, more on that later, but there is one more key animation technique that ties into Afro Samurai's animation style, their eyes. In Afro Samurai, you almost never see the characters as eyes, and in the times where you do, it's for a quick means of conveying what that character is thinking. Afro's eyes will become visible when he sees an opening or to subtly convey some sort of emotion, which is crucial for the viewer since Afro doesn't talk very much. And yeah, both characters have this trait in the episode, but with Afro's eyes, they're drawn with blink and you'll miss it little white lines. One of the first times we see them open is during the first shot of the bridge's rope tearing apart. It's something that he keeps in mind before he eventually cuts down the whole rope. But more often than not, the white lines in his eyes convey a sense of struggle in the fight, such as when Jack pushes him back and, of course, his final moments before his death. Jack's eyes also have this effect as well, even if it's to a lesser degree. Some shots have his eyes blacked out in the same way that Afro's are, and when they're open, they're handled as normal eyes. They even use this to implement Jack's iconic stare, emphasized with a Kotsuzumi drum and one of those aspect ratio adjustments. Another highlight is how Jack's eyes are hidden behind his hat at first, but once it falls off, his eyes become more visible, showing off his anger and determination to win. Not that his eyes never appear when he has his hat on, but they usually don't. 
And then Afro takes advantage of this and throws a cigarette into his eyes, forcing Jack to fight with his eyes closed. This is not so dissimilar to when Jack has his eyes closed in many of his fights. Of course, the burning from the cigarette doesn't last too long, but it does cause him to blindly swing his sword to further shave off the bridge's ropes. Not out of incompetence or desperation, but due to the pain in his eyes causing him to fight more aggressively. He does have his eyes closed throughout the vast majority of the fight onward, but it's to emphasize how he starts fighting harder and harder as the fight continues. You can even see this as his eyes have more lines drawn on them. Mmm. This is some really nice visual communication that is vital for an episode like this. Jack and Afro aren't known for their quirky one-liners or monologues or that kind of malarkey. Jack almost exclusively speaks when other people are talking to him or if he's communicating with people who don't speak themselves. And I'm pretty sure that Afro has less than like 10 lines of dialogue in his entire series. Even in the fight, there's only one verbal exchange after the setup, and even then all of their verbal exchanges are short sentences with five words or less. But let's take a break from the animation because now it's time to talk about the track. Fight Like a Devil may be my favorite of the season, but this one comes very close, at least in terms of how it matches the animation. Watch Out Samurai, despite the name pretty much only referencing Samurai Jack's series, has a lot of influence from the Afro Samurai soundtrack with its hip-hop beats and distorted basses. But the reason why I outspokenly appreciate this track so much is because of how it acts as a Gagaku blend. Now, this ain't my first rodeo with Gagaku blends. Watch Out Samurai mainly uses hip hop instruments, but they have Gagaku instruments as well, such as taiko drums and that good old shamus in style. It's a koto! There is no shamisen, you ingrate! Sorry, sorry. The koto is being played in one of the pentatonic scales used in Gagaku music. This one is commonly known as the in scale. Not every instrument remains in the scale, but the koto does. And you wouldn't be able to tell that because of the clever use of its minor thirds, especially when one of the electric guitars harmonizes with it in perfect fourths and fifths to fit within the scale. But later on, the koto drops out and is replaced with more traditional string instruments, mainly violins, which once again adds tension to the later parts of the fight. But my favorite part of the track is the electric guitar solo and heavy drums that play while Jack and Afro fall off of the bridge. But before we get into the aftermath of that scene, there is yet another aspect of Samurai Jack that this episode utilizes, which I'm going to dub the musical sync. Many fights in Samurai Jack will entice the viewer by occasionally syncing attacks with the background music music. I don't mean things like Mickey Mousing or anything like that, I mean matching animations with the rhythm of the track. Of course, not every music sync is intentional. In fact, I'm willing to bet that the vast majority of them weren't, but it's very obvious when they are. The animation helps to separate the different sections of the piece. Moments like Jack dodging Afro's sneak attack, introducing the bass guitars and the Koto melody, the jump good gag stopping the music and Afro's following attack, starting it back up with the violins coming in, the destruction of the bridge being what causes the electric guitars and heavy drum beat to start kicking in, and finally, the death cutting out all of the music to play a somber violin in part before the finishing blow repeats the opening lick one last time. Sold even more when you take into account how amazing this ending actually is. Once the bridge is destroyed, we see Jack falling down and Afro once again taking advantage of the situation by grabbing his sword and finding a chance to strike him from above. Striking in a very similar shot to his final attack on Justice, Jack notices him through a blurry reflection in the water and makes a decisive slash at the same time as Afro. What follows is Jack losing his arm and screaming in pain, which is sadly the closest we get to Jack's iconic war cry, but you know what? I don't mind it at all. The episode being more subtle and having no screaming until this point is more in line with the fight you see in both shows anyway. But when Jack loses his arm and starts screaming, it leaves more than enough time to sink in that Jack Jack may not be surviving this, but then it slowly pans over to Afro, who is revealed to have lost both of his arms. Let's take a look at these silhouettes. Why is this shot so phenomenal? You might notice that Jack used the exact same strategy that Afro used to cut off Justice's arms, where he cuts Afro from underneath. That is yet another cool reference that actually means way more than you'd think. Looking back at the setup, remember that Jack was the one who first mentions Afro's sword smelling of blood. He's seen enough bad guys and violent people to understand that Afro has no qualms with taking a life, something that Jack is well known for running away from when he can. 
He's no stranger to fighting aggressively, but he often wins fights when he's calm and collected, at least in comparison to his opponent. In this episode, he tried fighting Agro once, and that was what caused him to fall off of the bridge. Now that he's down in the water again, running lower on stamina than earlier, he's forced to control himself, close his eyes, and concentrate on this single decisive slice. The same kind of slice that Afro used to kill Justice out of vengeance. This headband scene is a metaphor for Jack being the stronger fighter not just physically, but mentally and spiritually as well. In other words, this fight gave Jack a thematic victory in a matchup that technically doesn't allow for one. That is impressive. What follows is a conclusion that's about as solid as the average death battle conclusion. Except for the part where they measure Jack's feet in megatons of force and afros in tons of TNT. And also somehow this feat is not only way higher than I've seen most people place it, but it's also higher than Wonder Woman's durability from Thor vs. Wonder Woman. <laughs> that is really funny to me. I mean, one could argue that this episode is wrong by its own logic. But here's the thing. When converting Jack's durability feat to tons of TNT, this should be around 44 tons of TNT. Yes, that is less than Afro 72, but it's not that far behind. If we go off of the attack potency chart from Versus Battles Wiki, both numbers are within the same tier of city block level. But then we go into speed and the gap is much bigger, with them putting Jack over three times faster. Also, this corner box mentions that the magic properties on Jack's sword would most likely cut Afro's sword. And even if it wasn't there, the analysis directly mentions that Jack's sword is stronger than steel. And they never mention any similar feats for Afro's sword. And I'm pretty sure that his sword is basic steel anyway. Anyway, so yeah, in a somewhat roundabout way, this episode is correct by its own logic. Still kind of dumb that they compared megatons of force to tons of TNT. Maybe that's why the editor just listed it as megatons so that people with short attention spans wouldn't notice, but eh, what can you do? Look at the mental gymnastics I'm going through to defend an otherwise flawed conclusion. This is the only time where I've ever had the energy to do so, and there's a good reason for that. Actually, a lot of good reasons. I mean, how many more do you want? It has an engaging set of analyses, well-written quips, and an animation that is not only fast-paced, but also has some of the best utilization of Louise's trademark pacing and humor. Virtually nothing is wrong with this animation aside from one arbitrary continuity error, as well as some cheap cuts in the aspect ratio that you will only ever notice if you can even pay attention to the aspect ratio changing at all. This is just straight up my favorite episode of Death Battle. You might be calling blue curtains on all of this. And you know what? Maybe you're on to something. I wouldn't be surprised if Louise outright told me that not everything that I discussed was intentional. However, when you actually decide to open those blue curtains, you can find something really special. So with that in mind, it is my honor to give Jack vs. Afro a well-deserved 100 out of 100. Not bad, Louise. Not bad in the slightest. <laughs> You might think that is some bad luck because the next episode has to live up to these expectations, but mm -mm, I'm not going to be like that. Just because one episode went well above the standard doesn't mean that every episode should do so as well. If anything, that should set the bar at a really nice place for what the standard actually is. And here we have the third and final asterisk of the season. That just so happens to have its own asterisk as well. Okay, so I guess I bamboozled you twice, twice on the whole asterisk thing, sure. Carnage in general was a hugely popular request for Death Battle, but his two most popular matchups were Darth Maul and Alex Mercer. One character is just that they have similar fighting styles, and the other character is that they are red and they hate dying or something, I, I don't know. Death Battle realized this, and they switched to a far less popular character that just so happened to be more thematic than either one of them. I don't like Carnage nearly as much as I like Venom, but I acknowledge that his power set is really cool, and he was super popular in Versus, and I think he still is today. Carnage as a character, I've always thought was similar to the Joker, where the entire appeal is how much of a joy he is to watch on screen. Not that I think he's nearly as entertaining, but this is generally why he's such a popular character, at least to my understanding. But I wasn't expecting to fall in outspoken appreciation with his analysis. I mean, it was alright. Learning about Cletus's backstory was pretty cool, and I like Boomstick saying, Oh, uh, you mean the number- <laughs> What kind of voice would- I like Boomstick saying, You mean the murders they knew about- 
Phoenix Wright? What? Ah, fuck it. You mean the murders that they knew about? Yeah, you can't beat the classics. But aside from that, I couldn't get too much from it. The writers were able to do the best they could with him. And as for Lucy's analysis, well, they technically give a content warning saying that Lucy's methods are not for the faint of heart. Okay, fair enough. I've never watched or read Elfin Lead. I probably will at some point, but I can see it being incredibly violent just with the first kill alone. But I was not expecting them to show clips of the anime depicting a child version of Lucy completely naked, which in their defense they do censor, and a clip of Lucy peeing on the floor, which they don't censor. Look, I'm not demonizing Death Battle over this. At no point do they draw attention to any of these clips, but I do think that a little more care should have been put into the B-roll of Lucy's analysis. That's all. Other than that, I thought that it was interesting. They covered her alternate identities really well, at least from what I could tell, and I like how Boomstick was acting like a support coach for Lucy at multiple points, even if he was just basically like, RAH, GO KILL EVERYONE! But given how much of her backstory they cover, I think it's justified. But the fight I find a lot more interesting to talk about. The first thing I'd like to point out is that the atmosphere is amazing. The intro starting off with a train on a rainy night, but then the storm increases once the music kicks in and blood starts to fly onto the window of the train, and Mew's expression jarringly changing right when the lightning strikes, and then the doors open with a sound effect that almost sounds like heavy breathing, with carnage being revealed in the shadows, highlighted by a pool of blood and some flashing lights, basically guiding the viewer to where he is on the train. And then we have some really, really good looking hand-drawn shots, specifically with carnage yelling, RUN! And Mew defiantly turning into Lucy. Seriously, Jerky did an amazing job with all this hand-drawn stuff. Oh, um, Lucy, I think you might have taken a little too much advice from Engineer. But aside from that one and maybe a couple of Lucy's final shots before the kill, there's a lot of hand-drawn stuff and they all look spectacular. Normalize giving props to Jerky, it's okay. And going back to the atmosphere, the train station being completely gray makes Lucy's invisible vectors as well as Carnage and his vectors pop from the background, yet his colors are just muted enough to where it never takes away from the horror vibe it's going for. This alone makes it a very comfortable rewatch, and that's to say nothing of the stellar voice acting. Chris Guerrero's carnage is just fantastic. I adore his cheeky little cackles, his fun line reads, aside from his last line, and his mannerisms. Chris sounds like he's having a total blast. And Danielle McRae's Lucy is also pretty great. I mean, she doesn't have too many lines, but from what I know of the character, that's kind of the point. In fact, a lot of her voice acting is really just her breathing heavily. Funnily enough, this panting is genuinely some of my favorite voice acting of the episode. It's really good at conveying both Lucy's fear of Carnage and her necessity to kill him. This alone feels like Lucy is doing everything she can to get rid of Carnage. That moment when your breathing makes me feel more emotion than the entirety of Android 18 versus Captain Marvel. <laughs> Although that's not the only impressive use of sound design in this episode. Although music is not really sound design. But yeah, Chorus of Carnage is an amazing track. It's kind of got a minimalist vibe to it, but with the differing chords, textures, and the like, it makes me listen to it on its own quite a bit. Although I did notice that it has the near exact same leitmotif as Stronger Together. Oh, you might think that I really, really like this episode. And now that I just brought up this tangent, you might think that I'm gonna say something negative, and this actually makes a big deal in the episode because I just don't find the choreography that interesting. I wouldn't say that this is spiteful towards Carnage. What? 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 I buy the rhetoric that Carnage is the dominant force of the entire fight, as well as the fights in general being less like a back and forth sort of thing and more like one person is trying to keep the opponent away. Though it's not handled perfectly. Aside from Lucy's breathing and panting, which to be fair, there is quite a bit of, there's no clear indications that she's actually exerting herself that much, or even changing into one of her stronger forms. I mean, I was able to notice this because I saw her horns popping out in the hand-drawn sections, and the analysis also mentioned that her vectors become more visible the stronger they become. But when they show Lucy's horns coming out in the sprites, you can barely see them. This was definitely not spiteful towards Carnage, like not even half a percent close, but I think that some communication could have been clearer. Anyways, about my issues with the choreography. A lot of it is just the whole vectors thing, which, yeah, is unique, but eventually you realize that a lot of the attacks are just the two of them, well... 
And that's not exactly the most enjoyable fight to watch. Though admittedly, I do kinda like the death. I mean, yeah, Carnage's last words are pretty limp, but the explosion has a good sense of scale, the sound design is pretty decent, and the punch not only clearing the storm, but also turning the mute blacks and grays into a more appealing green, even if the whole station is basically destroyed, was a really nice touch. And I like how it leaves some fire to convey that it was an explosive punch, like what the conclusion says. But aside from that, I don't think this is a masterpiece, but it's not a hate piece, it's just a piece. 69 out of 100. But despite this score, I would more likely come back to this one than other episodes I would consider decent. Holy crap, Lois, they actually gave Transformers a serious episode, and they brought Gundam back as well. That's right, braggers, and just like with Tiger Zord vs. Epion, Ben got to do the writing on this one himself, fitting how it also had something to do with Nick, albeit this time Nick was leaving. But onto the analyses, Primes was pretty good. There's a weird compositing thing going on, but from what I'm understanding, it's mostly in regards to feats. But if they composited any story beats, let me know. And I guess the Wall Street joke was smile-worthy. I mean, I wasn't expecting any joke to make me laugh, but that one got something from me. Although one highlight of Prime's analysis is that they only give him one weakness in that he's too nice and he would never act as an aggressor. <laughs> cohesion in the analysis. As for Gundam's analysis, alright, I'm not a Gundam guy either, and I've also heard that this episode is kind of worse once you start learning about Amaro and his story, but speaking as an outsider, I thought his analysis was better. But have you ever thought about how Ben insisted on having multiple Gundam series represented, yet he never once considered to include any Final Fantasy characters outside of Seven, or any Power Rangers characters outside of Mighty Morphin? Hey guys, what's stopping you from doing this aside from nothing? But I could feel more passion with this analysis since unlike with Gundam Wing, which Ben didn't exactly care for, he loved the original Gundam series. So much so that he was disappointed to find out that Optimus stomped Gundam so damn hard. And there's the whole psychic thing with Boomstick saying that it is the dumbest explanation for why someone gets powers. You know what? I can see that. I think that the end clip they chose is even worse, not gonna lie, Wiz. But as for the fight, I know I already used this meme, but I'm really not gonna sugarcoat it. This is literally the prettiest looking episode of the season. Ryo vs. Jin had gorgeous 2D effects. Jack vs. Afro had a mastery of simplicity. Carnage vs. Lucy had a perfect atmosphere and mostly phenomenal hand-drawn shots. But Prime vs. Gundam outdoes all of them in the most important factor of the visuals. The lighting. When they're in space, all of the lights and lasers are essentially perfect. And although they're not in the space station for very long, when they are, it's genuinely the best looking environment in the pre-Devil Artemis era. Hell, this episode straight up has a better environment than a few of his episodes. And even when they're on the ground, despite a barren looking wasteland, it still looks really nice. And like with Jack vs. Afro, the simplistic background helps make the combatants stand out even more. The worst I can say is that in a couple of shots, they kind of look more like action figures, and one shot during the death looks like it may or may not have needed some more rendering, but otherwise, the look of this fight alone is gonna give it a good score. And this is because this was the first fight to be animated in the Unreal Engine. And another note about the animation is that even though Torian wasn't the lead animator, he did supervise this fight. But either way, these animators have a lot to live up to, so let's see how they did. The space battle is really cool aside from... Sure, the beam rifle only has 16 shots! <laughs> Okay. And then there's the melee fight that they have on the ship with the Gundam dual wielding and Prime using his axe to break the shield. It doesn't last for very long, but he gets saved by what comes next. There's this shot of Prime using his blaster to shoot underneath the Gundam to use the explosion to propel him towards his punch, and then Amuro basically does the same thing, and it outright destroys the station and forces them to fight on Earth? Oh, that is so rad! And to think that the fight gets even better. <sighs> Complete with a weirdly badass callback to Gundam's analysis. Okay. Once they get to melee combat, yep, there's that Torian supervision. But seriously though, this flip kick with Prime grinding his tire heel into the Gundam's head is so rad. And this is where Amuro's psychic powers progressively become less reliable. The first time it happens in space, it's successful, no downsides. The second time is also successful, but Optimus is still able to break his shield, forcing him to use his beam swords. And then the third and final time it happens, he's just not fast enough to dodge the shots from Prime's blaster, reflecting one of the minor points 
points from the conclusion. That's pretty nice. As for the audio side of things, the sound design is good, but the voice acting, it's kind of a mixed bag, although it does need some explanation. Amino's voice is pretty great, especially his last line. But as for Prime's voice? Okay, this is kind of interesting for me to talk about. Take a listen to Prime's normal voice in Transformers. One shall stand, one shall fall. Though if you need a more modern take on the voice... The Autobots will never sacrifice freedom. Yeah, there it is. And then here's Peter Collin describing how he got the voice. Just wait, I got a point to make here. He goes over how he developed the voice and how his brother Larry Collin essentially influenced him. Here's what his voice would most likely have sounded like if Larry Collin didn't talk to him before the audition. I'm Optimus Prime. Now I'm gonna repeat this clip a few more times just so you can really get an idea for what this voice sounds like. I'm Optimus Prime. I'm Optimus Prime. I'm Optimus Prime. Now let's listen to what Prime sounds like in this Death Battle episode. Vile Decepticon, I have been in battle for countless eons. But of course, I need to talk about the track, Wings of Iron. Okay, yeah, this track is just as good as everyone says it is, even if I do prefer Fight Like a Devil, and Watch Out Samurai, and Crash and Burn, and one other track that I'll be getting to later in this season, and a few others from future seasons. But if anything, I think that should speak volumes as to how talented Therwolf is in general, even if they refuse to release the instrumental versions of their music, along with the fact that they forgot to credit Daniel Vance and Galvin as the singer. Oops. But the worst part about it is the ending. Amaro's last line is great, but Prime's last line is not. References replacing dialogue is a genuinely interesting conversation that I will absolutely be having later on, but for now, I'll just say that this is not how to do it. It just feels so shoehorned. I mean, yeah, they shoehorn the more than meets the eye line as well, but in hindsight, it was probably just a leftover from its reveal at RTX 2018. Weird how it was never cut, but eh, I didn't have that much investment in the episode when I first watched watched it, but following this revisit, the analyses were just fine, and my awareness of Prime's character and how it was poorly handled in the fight do kinda hold it back, but the visuals, choreography, and music were impeccable enough to make this a great episode. 81 out of 100. But nobody tell Optimus Prime that he killed a human. <laughs> ah yes, the first live-action death battle episode ever. The first of two of them. But this episode was a collab with a YouTube channel known as Ismahawk. Now the original plan was to make this episode an actual collab. Not only was the fight going to be on Death Battle, but the setup was going to be incredibly elaborate with a dedicated narrative posted on the Ismahawk channel. But for this one, it had to be cut due to deadlines and budget concerns. While it would have been cool to see Death Battle collabing with someone that isn't Rooster Teeth, I think that they made the right choice to streamline it so that it was made for Death Battle specifically, as opposed to being an episode made for both Death Battle and Ismahawk. It just works out for everyone and makes the production smoother. And that's exactly what they claimed. So it's good to know that the process was smooth and that there weren't any delays, time crunches, setbacks, or what have you. But now that that's out of the way, how is the first live action episode of Death Battle? Well, everyone was saying that the analyses were boring while also not explaining why they were boring because I thought they were really intriguing. Except for the part where they unironically play the You got knocked the fuck out, me! That's even cringier than them using the where you at meme in Ryu vs. Jin. I like how they brought up Dick's relationship with Batman, starting off with how Bruce had to ditch him as a sidekick, then bring up how Nightwing was trained by the Batman, and then end off with how they made up in the end. It's engaging stuff, it has good pacing, and it makes the ending note pretty strong. And I also thought that Daredevil's analysis was better. They covered his backstory very well, the cinematic music makes it more engaging, and they cover his blindness in an enticing way. Like where they cover the whole rewriting of the brain. It's actually similar to what happened to me when I lost my sense of smell in middle school, where my senses of taste and touch improved astronomically. Wait, what's that? You say that the sense of smell is 90% of your taste? Well then how come that doesn't apply to me? Explain that one, you commenting wankers. But as for the fight, all right, I will admit this ain't too great. There are people who say that it's bad because Red Hood versus Winter Soldier is better in every way. Is anyone trying to say otherwise? Wow, it's almost like improvement and learning from mistakes are very basic concepts that every human being on this planet goes through multiple times in their lives. Oh, and you're just not gonna elaborate on why Red Hood versus Winter Soldier is better in every way? Sorry for expecting people to do the bare minimum, I guess. Though there is this other criticism that it being live action actually hinders the episode. Really? What? Well, then again, there's also going to be some elaboration on this, right? There's no elaboration. 
People really are just talking out of their ass. Well, it is a versus community, so that checks out. What makes you think this fight would have been better in sprites or 3D? Because personally, I wholeheartedly disagree. I mean, we've already had a street tier sprite fight in this season, and several more before then. What makes you think this one would have been better if it wasn't live action? Oh wait, you also say that it being live action is the only reason it stands out. So like, uh, doesn't that also disprove that previous point you made? Okay, no, no. If this was sprites or even 3D, then there would be certain moments that just straight up would not work as well. Take this scene where they take a break from the fight to breathe a little bit, or like recollect themselves and readjust their limbs or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When they tried this in sprites, they would either just get back up as if they didn't take that much damage in the first place, or just shrug it off as if they didn't even get hit at all. And if this scene happened in a 3D animation, I mean, I guess you could get this to work, but death battle animations just don't have time to do that sort of thing anymore. Oh, and there's also the point that people say that Isma Hawk's own versus show is much better than this. Again, without explaining why. Literally just add two more sentences of elaboration. It's actually very easy to do. To be fair, this criticism isn't unreasonable, but here are some subtleties that I think we should be taking into account. When going over to Isma Hawk's versus show, the waiting period between each episode is far longer than Death Battles, and Isma Hawk started just around the time Death Battle was using a more consistent schedule. And as I mentioned earlier, this episode was going to have way more to it, at least in terms of the setup. Maybe there were supposed to be some more bits of choreography, some more action scenes, some more moments, whatever. But either way, Isma Hawk was not used to working on a schedule like Death Battles. Again, they had to streamline everything. So, now that those, let's be real, idiotic criticisms are out of the way, am I saying that this episode's good? Well, it does have its pros and cons. I think Nightwing's actor is pretty good. It's played by the founder of Isma Hawk, but he has played Nightwing multiple times before, so it makes sense. Oh, and if anyone accuses this episode of being biased because Danny played Nightwing, Chad James Taser. <laughs> And the guy that plays Daredevil is also pretty good. His voice is distinct enough. But as a fight, I think that it has good choreography, interesting shots, excellent costume designs, and even a decent use of the environment. Moments like Nightwing throwing his electric billy clubs to shock Daredevil, who just no-sells it and uses his club to bounce it off of a car and hit Nightwing in the back of the head. And then there's also Nightwing using his billy club to break a circuit box and turning off the lights, forcing a dark red glow to represent Daredevil's vision. Plus it just adds a really, really nice atmosphere. And I also think the music is kind of slept on. Maybe it's not a track I'd listen to on its own, but it has a really solid minimalist vibe to it, and it fits the fight really well, especially when the lighting changes. I would legit take this over a boring mashup of already existing leitmotifs that does almost nothing interesting with them beyond mashing them together in a milk toast track, or a track that's just a worse version of a song that already exists. We'll admit this episode has some legitimate problems. One of those being the dialogue. I think it had some neat exchanges on paper, but they're hindered by some weird deliveries. The first exchange is mostly fine, if not a bit overwritten, but let's take a look at this one. Where are you? Better. The delivery of better is taking way too long, and that's because of the peculiar choices in editing. They should have cut the scene of Nightwing taking out his electric billy clubs, moved it to after Daredevil's line, or at least he should have said, what are you, during that scene. And then there's this last exchange. I wish I could see the look on your face. Me too. This one, the problems are much easier to see, but I can get what they were going for. Daredevil's likely supposed to be tired or worn out while saying this. But if they wanted to add a pause, then Daredevil should have been saying it while he was walking. You know, I wish I could see, pause to stop, cut to Daredevil, the look on your face. That just feels more natural to me. Another issue is that while I do like the choreography, some of the attacks do feel weak. The sound design is good enough to compensate for most attacks, but there are a few other times where that's not the case. Like this scene of Daredevil lightly tapping his clubs around Nightwing's head. Oh, and of course the death sucks. This is probably the one thing people actually elaborate on when talking about this episode's problems. And yeah, I do agree with those issues. There's Daredevil's poorly delivered screaming and Nightwing's dumb face as he winds up his punch, which in itself is barely even a death. And then there's the conclusion. It's fine, but it's also weird how they bring up all of these superhuman feats and say that they're not actually superhuman. <laughs> 
pick one, guys. And also, there's that f***ing PSI nonsense. Though, to be fair, it is focused on their arsenals, and that is represented well enough in the fight. Overall, this is a decent, albeit uninteresting episode that I feel gets more hate than it deserves. 54 out of 100. Contrary to what the Death Battle community randomly feels like wanting you to believe, it's really not that difficult to explain its problems. And no, other live-action fights that came after this episode being better is not a criticism. Especially if you refuse to explain why for no reason be real! Uh, alright, alright, let's calm down now, let's calm down, because we got a very special milestone coming up next. never happened before. Are you telling me every single time you've set up the camera? What you did not actually this? live. Episode 100 of Death Battle. Not only is this a long-time legacy matchup that was heavily requested to get a rematch, but this also debuted the animated Wiz and Boomstick. I actually don't have that much to say beyond them being animated a little choppier than I remember, but eh, this was the first time and those choppy animations got cleaned up by the time the next season rolled around, so I can ignore it. Despite this being episode 100, it was never intended to be a super special episode with an extended length, more animation potential, or what have you. It was just gonna be a classic match, new rules, animated by Blind Ferret once again. I mean, I do kind of wish that it got a longer runtime, at least by a full minute, but at the same time, we got that six and a half minute season finale to look forward to, so fair enough. Their rivalry is legendary. Their fame unmatched. This is still one of the best preludes they've ever used. If only the analysis lived up to such an iconic line. Seriously guys, sex jokes about Peach stopped being relevant in 2010, and they stopped being funny or clever the moment they came into existence. Why, Why are, are there, there two, two of them? them? Knock, Knock it off, off stupid. stupid! Though it does have a good gag about Donkey Kong, and the Golden Chain Chomp bit was okay, kinda wish it stuck with being a Boomstick is actually really smart kind of joke instead of Boomstick saying that he got the cost from some guy trying to rob him. But still, there's some enjoyment to be had with Mario's analysis. Wish I could say the same for Sonic's, as this one sucks. The pacing is halted at the start with the Sonic Sad AM cartoon intro, and then Boomstick's cutaway gag has him singing a parody of it with STD. You should keep yourself- but I don't care about any jokes that fall flat for me. What I do care about is that more than half of the rundown is them trying to figure out Sonic speed. Ignore the accuracy in the numbers that they use real quick. Personally, I don't care about them anyway. What I do care about is that this is literally some of the most boring content I've seen in a Death Battle episode. Especially when you compare it to what they talked about for Mario. They go over Mario's careers, backstory, power-ups, and even some growths he's gotten over time. But with Sonic, they barely even talk about him. They just say humans and anthropomorphic animals coexist. Sonic stops Eggman, hedgehogs have super speed, and then it's right to discussing how fast Sonic is. They barely even talk about his abilities that much. Like, why did we even need all of these numbers for his speed when it didn't even give him the win in the first place? Look, I get that Sonic is known to be very fast, but they've had multiple speedsters on the show before, and when they discussed their speed, they would get to the point. And that's also what they did when they previously covered this speedster in particular. I mean, I guess I can get what they were going for. Kind of an inverse on the usual rundown where they focus on speed feats instead of strength and durability feats. But it's not structured the same way. Sonic's rundown is intro, background, ability, speed, more abilities, feats, and it ends. Not even the cutaway gags added anything, but again, it's their first time, I won't be too harsh. So now that we're done with such a boring analysis, let's go into the fight. Oh, this looks really nice. Everything's all colorful, they go to different parts of the island, some of the items and background elements have the iconic Mario eyes on them, Mario tears off his skin to reveal his overalls, there are some really nice visuals here. And as for the voice acting, Mario's voiced by the same person as Sephiroth, live with it. And this is where NAL gets to shine as Sonic, and he does an amazing voice for the character. It's just that the way he's directed and Sonic is written doesn't bring the best from him. Like when Sonic says, You asked for it, Tubby! It kinda sounds like he's shuddering. Though, to be fair, he's also trying to reflect Sonic getting up from the ground, so okay. But I can't really excuse the rest of the characterization. Low-key, it feels like that this fight was written by some Mario fanboy who was so bothered by the fact that Mario lost his previous episode, he decided to turn this fight 
it into some kind of hate piece. Now, no, 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 I'm not trying to say that it is a hate piece. I highly doubt that Ben would let that fly for an episode 100, and even if he did somehow let it slip underneath him, I guarantee you there would be a lot more people talking about it. And no, I'm not referring to the Salty Sonic fanboys who are vehemently upset that Sonic lost. But I'd be lying if I said that Sonic wasn't done really dirty. Sometimes he acts so slowly and incompetent for no reason, slowly killing Mario's clones as hypersonic even though they mentioned that hypersonic has an instant kill flash attack. Not that it would have killed Mario, but it at least would have gotten rid of its clones. And he also lets himself get bombarded by the clones while having a bubble shield, even though he has more than enough time to get out of the way, and flailing his arms haphazardly when he has a homing attack that he uses immediately after his bad strategy doesn't work, so it's like, what was the point of this? And Mario, look, even if you ignore my Nintendo character analysis and how Mario characters are deeper than what people think, Yes, I still stand by that, what of it? Mario's not that difficult of a character to get right. Make him happy, make him jolly, he's supposed to not be this aggressive. You know all of those memes that portray the drastic changes in personality between normal Mario and Smash Brothers Mario? Yeah, Death Battle's using Smash Brothers Mario for some reason. And yet they forgot the forward aerial, are you kidding me? Going back to Sonic, you know how he's really fast? Tell me why this fight feels weirdly lethargic. Okay, this is <laughs> kind of embarrassing, but... <laughs> like, the best way I can simplify this criticism is with... <laughs> The damn nostalgia critic. <laughs> I I hate myself. But in his Smurfs movie, he brought up the whole thing about like a uh, lazy movement where everything moves the same speed. Funny enough. What's more engaging, watching Mario go one speed throughout the entire game or having him stop, slow down, go backwards, stomp on things? Yeah, this fight kind of does the former, not gonna lie, Doug. <laughs> And I swear, that is the last time I will ever rely on Nostalgia Critic for anything ever again. I didn't even write that down in the script. I, I genuinely didn't know how to approach this. But yeah, there's barely a difference in speed between Sonic completely blitzing Mario, Sonic getting knocked through these trees, Sonic jumping out of the water, Mario dashing in his cat form, the two of them flying across the water and then into space, and even the two of them falling back into orbit. Am I the only one that's noticing this? Yeah, probably. I guess this fight does have some cool stuff though. They don't use too many of their power-ups, especially Sonic, but I will admit Mario uses some interesting combinations of his power-ups, like the cat suit and double cherry, and the star man and winged cap. Oh, and with his incredibly delivered Mexico. Sets up an exciting climax that, okay, I'm sorry, I can't get into. I can't look past this loop animation, I'm sorry. However, them breaking the moon with the Olympic pose was a really cool addition. And I do also like how they both get one last quirky one-liner before they fall into orbit. And while I don't like what leads up to it, the death is great. <laughs> For that reason alone, of course. And then there's the superhero landing, followed by the explosion with Mario eyes. Yeah, this is a good death. Also, Mario puts on Sonic's shades and sees Wily Castle. I guess. But you know what? It's nice to see these outro clips again, given that they pretty much stopped using them at this point. Aside from, like, some very rare exceptions. But even then, they stopped after those two. The conclusion doesn't have too much to say, but I do like the cutaway gags with Wiz using all the power-ups that Mario doesn't use in the fight. Overall, I'm not the biggest fan of this episode, but I'm not gonna be one of those people that's all like, This is so bad, it's such a bad episode, there's almost nothing good about it, except for like, one, one minor thing that I thought was really cool, but even then, everything else completely overshadows that one good thing into something that's bad. Anyway, 6 out of 10. Yeah, that sounds nothing like a 6 out of 10. At best, that sounds like the score I'm going to give this episode. 45 out of 100. Yes! I am directly implying that Nightwing vs. Daredevil would have made for a better episode 100. But you know what? Unlike with Goku vs. Superman 2, this one didn't really make me mad or anything. I just thought it was unfortunately dull. Blind Fair did a really nice job with the fluid animation, but everything else about it just lets me down quite a bit. But, ah oh well, I feel optimistic about how this season is gonna end, so uh, surely the next matchup is gonna be cool, right? HELL
death battle? Seriously! You gave me a milestone episode that I felt completely conflicted on, and then you just dropped that the next time it's gonna be one of my most wanted matchups? That's two nickels, death battle! Why did it happen twice? I thought that you hated me for being a Blade Blue fan! Okay, but seriously, this is actually a super important episode to me specifically. And yes, that is entirely because of the matchup. Although it doesn't have that much to do with the characters. I quite like Ultron and Sigma, but the reason why this was one of my most wanted matchups has less to do with them and more to do with a game that popularized the matchup in the first place. And given that I know how this matchup got such a fast rate of request and what game popularized it, I will say that you can say whatever you want about it, your opinion is valid, but at the same time, maybe it goes to show that the game in question has a lot more pros than what you randomly felt like thinking and looking back you only decided to hate it more than most things in existence because the internet assumed it was going to be the worst thing on the planet because three or four characters were missing from the roster despite having more than enough characters that mattered in the series and graphics that look a little below average even if it still looks better than plenty of other modern games with ugly graphics. So in retrospect you were only upset about the PR and marketing which are absolutely irrelevant at this point since there is no reason to care about any out of line statements for a game that's around six years old at this point and has more positives than negatives which the majority of consumers and critics openly admitted multiple times but we don't want to talk about that because the older game is so much better in every way even though those same people loving said game for justifiable reasons I completely agree with, yes. But at the same time, a good chunk of it was most likely out of spite because they never said anything good about it or even had interest in playing it or the series it's a part of. It stays peak gaming even though people used to get beat up in more ways than one for saying anything positive about that game as well as the fact that it took a worse port of the inferior version of the game to get people to start loving it again. But people denied that it was ever the case because there's a new game to hate even though you only ever criticize two or three things about the game despite there being more than three good things about it. So maybe the game's nowhere near as bad as what you've been gaslighting yourself into thinking. <laughs> Ultron's analysis was good. I surprisingly like the Boomstick dad joke. It's less Boomstick whining about his daddy issues and more about Wiz roasting him for it. I kind of wish that every Boomstick dad joke had a variation like this. And there's also the part where Ultron sex bots his mom. <laughs> Man, that is not a type of trivia you would find in other episodes. The other jokes were just... Eh. But the story beats they talk about do make up for it. They cover his abilities and AI programming feats really well, but admittedly, while it's good, it doesn't have the great sense of intimidating villainy that other analyses for villains have gotten before and since. You know, like what Sigma's analysis got. It has some banger jokes like the Kuwanger tangent, Wiz at the bar, eating Maverick Hunter ass, and the Wily pod. And the incorrect story beats from Metal Sonic vs. Zero? Solved! They not only made the story intriguing, but they told it correctly this time. Nice! Seriously, God bless Liam Swan. I'ma tell my kids that this was DJ the Tiki. And then we have the fight. All right, Liam, let's see what you got. Well, first, let me talk about the voice acting. Ultron's voice is pretty good. Austin Lee Matthews has a nice take, though I kinda wish he went for something similar to Tom Kane's or Jim Meskimen's takes on the character. While he does get the superiority complex I look for in Ultron, it doesn't have that robotic edge to it that I'm looking for. Barring the voice effects, of course. I still think this is pretty good. Makes me wonder who's voicing Sigma. At the risk of sounding cliche, you and what army? Mohamed Ahmedoro! After that really cool introduction, actually. Nice hand-drawn shots, by the way. The fight has a brief glimpse of an army fight. Would have liked to have seen more, but I will admit, Sigma blitzing through Ultron's drones, and then Ultron immediately ripping off his sword. Okay, this was, this was actually very raw. Followed up by some even more raw moments, like Ultron dragging him against the Bee Blader's blades, and Sigma overwhelming him with teleports and beam attacks. <laughs> figures you'd use that phrase. Then once we get inside, this is where the body swapping starts coming into play, and then you get a kaiju fight. Okay, first off, this shot looks really good. And second off, Sigma just going ham on Ultron with a giant rocket fist in the laser. Mm, mm, mm. Feels so good. And then Ultron's kaiju form comes in and blows his head. <laughs> My Lanta, that is the sprite of the final boss of Mega Man X6 being used as battle damage? <laughs> that is brilliant! And then you have the final hack off with Ultron shrugging off the Sigma virus at the last possible moment, making for a really unique kill that may or may not count as a death? but it's still really good, and I like Sigma's head basically turning into Ultrons. That's nice. You might notice that I haven't brought up any major issues with this episode. That's because it only has one, and I don't like infection perfection that much. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Brandon. The lyrics, well written. The chorus, good. Everything else, 
I don't care too much. I don't like the vocal technique that Brandon is using, as it makes his vocal sounding off-key at points. And as for the instrumentals, it's alright, but I can only handle the mm ba 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 being the only melody for so long. Plus it has a lot of that single chord nonsense that I am just not interested in. But aside from that, this fight gave me everything I wanted and more, even if it technically doesn't live up to the potential that the matchup had. But I've seen this sort of thing thrown around all the time. It's often a valid criticism more than it isn't, but I swear, people are seriously mad that they didn't use every single thing in their arsenals. You can think whenever you want about an episode or how much of its potential was actually used. If it bothers you, that's okay, and if it doesn't bother you, that's also okay. But let me introduce the Robison's Potential Test. This is something that I came up with to justify whether or not the quote-unquote lack of potential impacts the episode, and if it does, how much. The moment I start thinking of or hearing about this criticism for an episode is the moment I start asking myself these questions. 1. Did the episode use a lot of their arsenals? This is often something that people can point out really easily. Just by paying attention to the analyses and what kind of powers and abilities they bring up. And if the answer is yes, great. But if the answer is no, then I immediately move on to question 2. Did the episode live up to the fight's core theme? Core theme also has something to do with connections, but in terms of the fight dynamic, what is the core theme, and how does it live up to it? And regardless of my answer, I move on to question 3. Did the episode utilize these in enjoyable ways? Now this question is easily the most subjective, as I still have my gripes with Naruto vs Ichigo despite it using a lot of their arsenals and forms, but I just didn't find the choreography that interesting. But what about Ultron vs Sigma? Let's review this episode with the potential test. Don't worry, this is just gonna be a one-time thing. So does the episode use a lot of their arsenals? Mm, not really. I mean, we barely get to see Sigma using his Z-Saber, and he doesn't use any of his other abilities. There's no claws, no fire attacks, not even his dog. And as for Ultron, he pretty much only uses his lasers. We don't see him using his Encephalo Ray, he doesn't summon any drones outside of body swapping, nor does his Molecular Rearranger come into play that much. Not to heal any wounds, and not through any of those Ionic Force expulsions. Although to be fair, if the deleted scene from the music video is anything to go by, they did intend tend to have Ultron use this, so fair enough. So let's move on to the second question. Did the episode live up to the fight's core theme? In spite of the limited arsenals? Absolutely. Both Ultron and Sigma are essentially AI. There's the Ultron AI and there's the Sigma AI virus. And they do what they're most known for, body swapping, hacking, etc. But did the episode utilize these in enjoyable ways? I would say so. It is used to some nice pacing and choreography. Sigma's getting frequently outclassed in the fight, so he has to rely on these unconventional means, you know, like body swapping and, of course, the virus. Oh, and a side note, I would like to point out that when Sigma gets possessed by Ultron, they use the explosion effects from the Mega Man X games. I find that to be pretty epic. And even though Ultron is doing the body swapping and infection thing as well, he's just adapting to Sigma's plans. Not only is this good pacing, but it also subtly reflects a major point in the conclusion where Sigma is fairly outclassed in every way. And I would argue that a conclusion making you rethink the fight's choreography in positive ways makes the overall episode that much better, especially when revisiting it. Would I have liked to see more? I mean, it was one of my most wanted, and let's be real, you are always going to want more from a matchup you really like. And that's why I created this potential test. And of course, it's not an end-all be-all. Episodes I like can fail the test, and episodes I dislike can pass the test. But in terms of addressing the criticism of the characters not being utilized completely, I run it by this test to see how much water it holds. And to me, a passing grade is getting two out of the three questions right. And with that in mind, this episode makes me so happy, man. 92 out of 100. This was infinitely better than episode 100. Not gonna lie, Wiz. But with that said, I was not expecting it to sweep the polls this hard. Like, I know I gave a pretty easy hint, but at the same time, if you voted correctly, give yourselves some extra bragging rights. Y'all were on point with this one. <laughs> <laughs> So, now we've gotten to an episode that's been getting a lot more popular lately, to a point where people are wondering if it's overrated? Mmm, maybe I'll think it's overrated. Man, man, don't, don't do that, don't do that, Jonathan, come on. <laughs> Roshi's analysis was, um, I think I enjoyed it? I mean, the beer Kamehameha cutaway wasn't too shabby, if nothing else, and I liked them covering his Kame-style training. There's the gag about the paradise plant, and then... 
Oh, if my hands can move that fast, I'd finally stop getting married. I don't get this one. But I don't know, I just couldn't get into this one as well. Aside from having a couple decent jokes, it doesn't feel like it stands out compared to other analyses. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that I don't like Roshi as a character that much, but I can still learn to appreciate characters I don't care for or even outright dislike just by hearing Death Battle talk about them. But the note they end off on, alright, I like that. Though Jiraiya's analysis, I know for a fact I like. They use both definitions of gallant, using the first one to highlight his perverted demeanor, and then using the second one to refer to him as brave and heroic, which they use for his ending note. Mm, that, that is nice, that is nice. And I also thought that the jokes were pretty funny. Even that one. But how is the fight? You know, the most important part of any episode. Roshi's foot isn't actually stomping on the book. Yep! This fight's overrated, it was never good! But for real though, the start is a little slow, and their sprites do clash a little bit, but after that, we get some fun uses of abilities, like using a Kamehameha to break out of the frog, trapping Gamabunta in the evil containment wave, and the Kamehameha versus Big Balrus Sengon struggle. Although it is weird how it's implied that he tanks the Kamehameha in this scene, when the conclusion outright says that he would need to avoid it. Though, to be fair, he does try to outrun the other two. And then there's this scene with the shadow clones on the beach. Oh hey, speaking of beaches. You have no idea. I've been back on the beach the whole time. You know, Shekov assigned two of his clones on the beach to hold his guns. I kind of wish I had more to say on why this moment became so iconic for the series, but it really is just a subtle Shekov's gun that, sure, you may not have noticed it, but your brain did. And I do think it's one of the better Shekov's guns that the show has used. I've also heard people say that the choreography is more like an early Dragon Ball slash early Naruto fight. I can't say for certain if it's the latter, but the former, yeah, I can totally see it. And given how many people are saying it, I have no reason to doubt that. But even if you take that out of the equation, I think that the fight focusing on all these mind tricks, as opposed to just I'm powerful, I'm the best you which isn't a big deal, but it makes this episode's fight stand up and shout. I think that the only time it doesn't work is with the death. It has a cool idea, with Roshi breaking out of the frog confrontation jutsu and killing him, but instead Roshi just wins? For some reason when I first watched this episode, I thought that he was going for the phony drunken fighting style that they brought up in the analysis, but in hindsight, it's probably just the trance? thing or whatever. Look, I'm not a Naruto guy, so I'm sorry for not knowing this. But I will say, Turtle and Toad is my second favorite track of the season behind Fight Like a Devil. So yes, I also think this is better than Wings of Iron. Again, it just goes to show how top tier this season's tracks are. Now that that's out of the way, is this episode overrated? Uh, I mean... Mm, I'll let you decide what I think about that. The fight does have a slow start, the death falls short of a good idea, and I just don't like Roshi as a character that much, but other than that, it's good. 82 out of 100. Gotta love that this episode also overshadows episode 100. I'm not sure whether that's based or unfortunate. Here we go, buddy. In a season of the most requested matchups, the only way to fit this is with the episode that had the highest amount of requests. And you know that Death Battle needed to make this as good as it can be. We got a six and a half minute fight to look forward to, another animation in the Unreal Engine, and it's Thanos versus Darkseid, the arch enemies of the Avengers and the Justice League respectively. That's all you need for a goaded matchup. So now explain to me why so many people hate this episode. The contrarian in me wants to say that this episode is good because I do think that some of the criticisms are kind of stupid. I mean, I was already pretty gracious towards Black Panther vs. Batman and Nightwing vs. Daredevil. So let's just get into this. Remember in Strange vs. Fate where I said that sometimes I don't want Death Battle to talk about their backstory, background, or tell any jokes? Because I would much rather focus on their massive power sets just to see how much of an overwhelming force they can be in the right hand? This analysis is exactly why. Because they replace all of the interesting powers with a bunch of shitty jokes. They almost immediately begin with a deviant art joke before even name dropping Thanos. With bad delivery too. I don't like this. And then you have a Captain Planet reference for no reason. And, ugh, okay, the Deadpool cameo, oh my gosh. I get why it's here, but why does it go on for so long? People hate this because season one also had no Deadpool. As if that's supposed to mean anything. It doesn't change the fact that they've had a season without Deadpool, but okay. Pfft, you death battle nerds and your weird criticisms. That's almost as dumb as saying Ragnar vs. Soul felt like a hate piece. Exactly, oh, wait. 
Hey. Sorry, horsey, we just ran out. Wait, since when could you see me? Well, let's just say I didn't want to overlook any more oversight, so I gathered some extra resources. Though admittedly, I don't know how to use this thing to its fullest. Well, you're using it better than Thanos did in this episode. <laughs> oh, Mortel, you're right. I mean, yeah, he does tilt the plane of existence a little bit, but other than that, he really does- Careful, careful, you're skipping a script again. Wouldn't want to have to do more tedious audio editing, would we? Yeah, you're- might be, might be. You show way too many symptoms of autism, you know that? I know, I know. And this coming from the guy whose voice actor has autism. When they actually talk about Thanos and his powers, it's really good. But they barely do that, because they don't even say anything about the gauntlet. They just say, oh, the colors of the Infinity Stones are different in the MCU than they are in the comics. Cool! But why is that the only thing you say about the gauntlet? This is black box worthy! They don't even say what the time gem, soul gem, reality gem- They don't say what any of them do! And when they do, it manages to get overshadowed by this stupid graph! Yeah, don't care! That's right, Boomstick! No one cares! So Wiz shouldn't even be bringing this up in the first place! Though I guess it's not like the black boxes would be that much better. They do have Thanos at Galaxy busting, but 274 septillion tons of TNT? What next? Are they gonna say something like galaxy busting is weaker than moon busting? To obliterate the moon in its entirety, the Kamehameha must have struck it with a force akin to three octillion tons of TNT. Bing -a, bing -a, bing -a, bing -a, bing -a, bing -a. Death Battle Calc moment aside, this is probably the one time where I do care about them lowballing characters to this degree. I understand that the general audience doesn't quite have a hold on universal, multiversal scaling, etc, etc, but with this, it's Thanos and Darkseid. I think that the general audience would be able to handle it, so I'm not sure why they were holding back this much. But then again, Darkseid is consistently placed at universal, so maybe his analysis is better? I mean, there are two MCU jokes back to back, with one of them being lazily edited. In a video with over 14 million views, by the way. And the other getting a dedicated clip. What? And then there's the Nomad of Nowhere. Okay, what the f is a Nomad of Nowhere? It only got one season and was almost instantly canceled before this episode was even announced. I mean, it could have worked if they would establish him as like a regular at death battle. Oh, who am I kidding? No one would ever do that. And just like with Thanos, they're less interested in talking about his powers and more interested in making terrible jokes. Yet despite this, his analysis was better than Thanos's. Cause at least they talk about things like the Omega Sanction, True Form Dark Side, what his avatars can do, but man, just the bad jokes and the unfortunate writing really does hold it back this much. Ugh. But with analyses this bad, the fight can't be this much worse, can it? I mean, it is better than the analyses, but by how much? Well, to begin with, I don't like Thanos' voice. Instead of sounding like a godlike being with a feeling of superiority, he sounds like my older brother. Darkseid's voice is better, I will admit, if not a bit higher pitched than I would like, but to be fair, unlike Thanos, Darkseid doesn't have an established voice, at least not to me. And okay, this fist fight, pretty good. With Darkseid just headbutting the gauntlet, that's pretty rad. And then there's the reality warping. This is good stuff right here. Oh, hi, Optimus Prime. There is a bit of street tearing and building crushing, which is the most they do, but I don't mind this. Seeing them weaponize buildings is really nice. But then we have Darkseid's Omega Beam. Instead of attacking Thanos, he focuses it on some f***ing glass. And I mean, this could have been a really cool moment if his Omega Beam went after the glass. And then as Thanos charges into him with his punch, there's a POV shot of the Omega Beam coming from behind Thanos, and then it hits him. This would also make Thanos pulling up his shield at the second Omega Beam even better, because at that point it makes more sense why he would see it coming. But I don't want to get too negative, because at the risk of making the worst pacing for no reason, let me just say, KINGS OF INFINITY F***ING SLAPS! I do not care what people think about it. I will die on this hill, it is good. There are people who say that the rap is really unfitting and that you can replace it with any other track and it would fit just as well, if not better. Oh. 
Well, that criticism's already incorrect. If you don't like the track, fair enough, but here's another way to look at it. Rap has a very commanding presence to it, and due to the track having other powerful instruments like an organ and those accented beats, this makes Omega Sparks' vocals venomous and strong. So personally, I think this does fit the fight, even if the animation and choreography don't always make it that way. Because I do agree with the criticism that it does feel like it goes on for too long. A track like this feels like it was made with a three and a half minute fight in mind as opposed to a six and a half minute one. And I guess if that's the case, there should have been more people working on this track, but eh, I still really like this track. And since I want to keep talking positively, I will say that once they go cosmic, the effects look beautiful. Even on the ground, the lighting and visuals look really solid, but when they go into space, mmm. Props to the Unreal Engine, and props to the people who worked with it. Nearly all of these visuals look great. Nearly all of the visuals. Darkseid climbing out of the black hole. It's a cool moment, especially when he crushes another one in his hand. But this part right here does look kind of bad. And also true form Darkseid looks really bad. But let's not get too far ahead of myself because I want to talk about the cosmic scale and how jarring it all is. I was fine with them starting off with a more grounded fight, but at this point the highest you could say they went to is like a multi-city block or maybe city level. And then they just go straight to destroying planets. Yeah, this is not a very good use of power creep. And then they go to manipulating the solar system, kind of, and then to universal destruction, maybe? I mean, there are a lot of people who have said that people haven't really seen planets blowing up or a universe being destroyed, but I don't know. I think Death Battles back then managed to do a pretty good job of it, with Vegeta punching the moon, Thor and Wonder Woman destroying the moon, Goku and Superman blowing up the planet they were fighting on, and even Chuck vs. Segata collapsing the entire universe. I thought they all had great impact, but I don't think Thanos vs. Darkseid did this very well. Sure, the effects look really pretty, but when you get down to what they're actually actually doing with those effects, some of it feels off. I can understand the planets not having great sound design because the planets casually breaking is supposed to represent how that's just a byproduct of their fight. But with the use of power creep and the fact that the sound design is still bad no matter how you slice it, it feels like there was supposed to be more impact. And when Darkseid is trying to stop a planet, the speed is completely messed up. There's this shot with the planet spinning in a rapid speed, and then we cut to Darkseid and not only did the planet randomly stop moving, it looks way smaller than the shot beforehand. Unless if this is supposed to be Darkseid changing his size? Uh, I don't, I don't know. And also these punching angles look pretty bad. And then there's this scene where I think it's supposed to be universal destruction. But then we cut to Thanos and Darkseid and they're resting on a planet, but they just destroyed the solar system and most likely the universe. What's this planet doing here? Or is it a moon actually? Well, that makes even less sense. What happened? There's also the criticism of Thanos losing somehow being obvious for a full minute. I mean, from a versus standpoint, yes, but in terms of the animation, no? And if it does, then the music at least gives a decent fake out. No, the actual problem is that snapping is pretty much all Thanos does with his gauntlet. In fact, am I the only one who thinks that Thanos' characterization is really weird? The analysis points out how he was always praised for his supreme creativity and intelligence. In the fight, he's kind of acting like a brain-dead brute. It feels like he's getting too easily fooled, too easily flustered when it's not like this, or if it is, it just feels like flanderization. If this was to represent the comics, then, um, good job, you made comic Thanos look lame. If this was supposed to reflect how he is in the MCU, then good job, you completely butchered Josh Brolin Thanos. And also, it's in the second half of the fight with- oh, oh, okay, this- first of all, this shot looks really ugly. But it's at this half of the fight where Thanos really starts to overuse the- Oh yeah! I am Thanos! Thanos is God! I am all things! This is who I am! I swear, that's like half his dialogue in this animation. And that's to say nothing of how little he utilizes his own power set. Am I alone on this? It's an honest question, I genuinely don't know. Anyway, we get to the true form Darkseid scene, and aside from true form Darkseid's appearance, I think the environment looks pretty nice, and it is lit very well. But then Thanos' snap stops working, then Thanos once again does the I am Thanos! I am a thing! Knock it off, bro. And then we have the death. The Omega Sanction. They go into a lot of detail as to what kind of death can happen during their first trip in the Omega Sanction. Oh my god, it's Deadpool with a gun! <laughs> <laughs> Now, I guess I can understand what they're trying to go for here. It's supposed to be a payoff to the Deadpool cameo. But at the same time, why stop with just a gun? Let alone a bullet that doesn't even pierce him. Why not go even further? You know, like... 
You know, like... Where the f*** are you, Wade? Oh, sorry, I was spacing out. Okay. <clears throat> oh my god, it's Deadpool with a gun! <laughs> and a sword! <laughs> and a grenade! And a hammer! <laughs> and a bat! And another sword! <laughs> and a gold hammer! And a barrel! <laughs> and a giant bat ring! And a hammer! And a fucking bazooka! Don't blame me, Johnny Boy. You did tell me to overdo it. Oh, no, no, you were fine. In fact, I expected this to happen. That's why I wrote the score right here. Anyways, you're free to go now. Cool! Till next season! Peace out! Now then, let's just get the gauntlet to switch to another ad break, and... Done. So, that was season five. Despite a weak start and an even weaker finale, this is one of my favorite seasons of the show. The ranking of the season might make it look as volatile as season two or even season four. And with the season as volatile as this, can I really say it's that much better than the previous four seasons? Well, you might notice that for the first time, this season doesn't have a single episode that falls below a 30. And even if you disagree with my take on season four with Metal Sonic vs. Zero being worse than Venom vs. Bane, I still think that the worst episode of Season 5 is better than Venom vs. Bane, as well as a minimum of two episodes from the other seasons. I think that improvement is a lot bigger than you'd think, because it means that the low points aren't as low as they used to be, which helps the high points stand out that much more. It really hits where the sun shines every day. There have been quite a few criticisms thrown its way, and to be blunt, some of them are really bad. Apparently Crash vs. Spyro is bad because of the autism tangent. Okay, I'm not gonna downplay that because of what I went over earlier, but I will downplay how the episode is also criticized for being a stomp, as if Death Battle has never done stomp matchups before and since. And they also say that Nightwing vs. Daredevil is bad because better fight scenes exist, even though you can apply that criticism to literally anything. Or Carnage vs. Lucy is bad because Carnage struggles to land a hit even though he is still the dominant force in the fight and Lucy is obviously putting an effort to fend him off. Or Leon vs. Frank isn't that good of an episode because... We don't like finishing our sentences, I guess. But there is one criticism that I not only agree with, but is also more common than all of these combined. Wasted potential. Personally, I'd argue that it started cracking into Death Battle around Naruto vs Ichigo, but it's the most apparent here compared to every other season of the show. Episodes like Sora vs Pit, Strange vs Fate, Mario vs Sonic, and especially Thanos vs Darkseid all have this issue. And I'm sure that you can make a case for other episodes as well. And with other seasons, I can only say that for about one, two, maybe three episodes at most. I guess there are a lot more episodes that I can say I wish that this episode had this or that, but not to the point where I can say that they definitely wasted their potential. It doesn't always ruin the episode for me, but they can do that for other people, and I get it. There's a reason why the more grounded fights are considered the best of this season. You know, episodes like Jack vs. Afro, Ryu vs. Jin, Leon vs. Frank. Hell, you could even argue that Roshi vs. Jiraiya and Carnage vs. Lucy are more grounded to a rough extent. But I do think it's also important to remember that Death Battle episodes are more than just representing the power sets of the characters and determining who would win. I think that this season has other strengths than that of the music, sound design, characterization, and usage of environments. Sure, they're not always spot on, but this season nailed them more than they didn't. Let's take a look at how it stacks up compared to the rest of the series. High quality episodes, exciting matchup spread, no troubled productions, and no changes in the schedule. Even the one time where they kinda did, they still pulled through and made my favorite episode of all time. We really have achieved peak death battle production. Heck, by the start of this season, they were able to finalize their merging with Rooster Teeth. So maybe an even better season will be awiting us next time. Time, huh? Thanks for the tip.